So are we, I don't think we're in practice session. I think we're live. Oh no, we're live now. And it looks like we're recording as well, Erin. I just click record. Okay, and we are um, public, I believe. Yeah, I think we're oh, good. No, it is recording. Here we go. Yep. Okay. Okay, right. so um, good evening, everyone. Today is January 13th, 2021. This is our first meeting of the Amherst Conservation Commission for the year. Um, so according to the agenda, comments from me first. I don't have any, so that is quick. Um, Dave is next. He is not here, so that's even quicker. And so just like that, it's up to you, Aaron. All right. Um, so the town just gave me a, a laptop which is so wonderful. And it's, I think, gonna make this much easier for me. Um, um, I can't see the, do we have any attendees other than CONCOM members right now? Yeah, we do. Okay. And they, and several have their hands up. Okay. Yeah, there's 13 people involved right now. All right, oh, let boy. me just, just uh, uh, sharing for just a second and see who's raising their hand. Uh, people are putting hands up and down. It's kind of like all over the board. So um, if I'm recognizing just... the team, the people who are raising their hands are, are from the district one group, which is exciting to see. Oh, is that is that the CPA stuff? And it looks like um, Leroy is an attendee right yeah. now. Oh. Um, and Aaron, I don't think I am a co-host, so I can't uh, let people in or out. Okay, let me... All right, Leroy's in. Aaron is rocking this new laptop, putting it through its paces. So you should be a co-host now, Brett. I am. Um, so, you know, the, the open space items aren't on until 710. So I don't know if you want to try to get some other business out of the way beforehand or if you how you want to tackle this. Yeah, I'm just gonna, um, there's a couple people with their hands up, so I'm gonna see if they have something to say quickly. Okay. Oh, no, or again, they keep going down. So, um, but yeah, so Mary has her hand up. So Mary, do you have something uh, you'd like to say at this point? Uh, no, you just you just asked if there were other people. So I'm, I'm a property owner. I'm here for the Canton Ave part. Okay, of gotcha. Agenda. Okay, yep, uh, we will be getting to those later. So thank you. Yeah, I do have one question though. Can I? Um, all I can, you you must all be um, committee members that I can see. I don't see okay. anyone who doesn't look like a committee member. Is that the way it will always be, or is there? Am nope. I not putting the right button? Nope, that is how it works here. So you are good. Oh, oh, okay, okay, thank you. Yep. She she will see other people when they're added to our thing, but not we're, we're the main ones. Yeah. So other panelists will be. So. Okay. So Aaron, did you want to start? Um, yeah, on those items? Sure. Um, I'll just start on one of the requests for certificates of compliance, because um, that's something that we could tackle really quickly. Um, this is uh, an Eversource request for certificate of compliance for the work at the um, Podic substation. And it's kind of a little tricky because when they, when they prepared the request for certificate of compliance, the site was fully stable, but you guys might recall that we issued a uh, determination of applicability for the repair of a, a um, duck line that went from Podic substation up to the Sunderland town line on Route 116, and that work's been underway. And so when I went out to do a site visit, the front northwest corner of the Podic site had had disturbance from where the duck line had been um, installed. So <laughs> I don't know how you guys want to handle it. Um, I mean, I don't, we have another order of conditions that's going to be beginning there. They did um, seed and mulch the disturbed area from the determination and that area won't be revegetated until probably mid to late spring. So they're trying to administratively take care of this before their new order of conditions starts up, which I think is good to do. Um, it's just like <laughs> when I went there, the site wasn't fully stable. So I wanted to give you guys that background. Um, 
and I will yield to whatever decision you make. I don't, I don't have a problem with the certificate being issued because I've got, I go by that site pretty much multiple, multiple times weekly. Well, I'm sorry, Aaron. So did you say that the place that's disturbed now is still under an order, a different order of conditions? Um, well, there's, so technically there's this order of conditions, which is DEP 89-667. Then there's also a determination of applicability that's also active. And that was for the replacement of the duck line, which actually they just finished, but it's they seeded it and mulched it. So they're just kind of wrapping up operations there now, but that's what's caused that additional little disturbance on the front corner. Um, and then the, pro the project that we just issued um, has, it's a new order of conditions that's gonna be starting up um, early this year for additional work at Podic. So we will have another active order of conditions on the site where work is beginning very soon. But that does not necessarily cover this area that's disturbed now. Right. It's uh, the area behind the substation that will yep, be. Where they're, put, where um, they're putting in the little road type thing. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Um, but so is this area, so I get what you're saying. It's out in the front and kind of goes up 116. Yeah. Um, but it's out, but it has been seated. So it is, it is stable at this point. It's, it's stable. It's just not um, vegetated. Oh, okay, but it's not going to be vegetated for a while. Right. So. I mean, I'm, I think, I mean, I think it'd be all right to give them a an, um, certificate of compliance as long as we just give them, give them a heads up, like, you know, that corner needs to get taken care of. The only reason I say that is because it's such a, it's such a, a busy place. They're going to be there all the time with that new substation. So that's where I kind of, that's my take on it. Mm -hmm. I agree. As long as we have some, yeah, mechanism to keep them in check, I'm good. Okay. So. Well, if others are comfortable with it, I have no problem with issuing the certificate. No. Um, I just need a motion. I'll make a motion to um, uh, for certificate of compliance for the Podic substation. Second. Okay, looking for a voice vote. So, Anna. Aye. Jen. Aye. Fletcher? Aye. Laura? Aye. Leroy? Aye. And Larry stepped away, so I'm not quite sure. <laughs> so no vote from Larry. I'm back. I'm back. I'm back. I'm okay. here. So, but Larry, did you oh, hear Larry. everything? Are you yes. Able to... Okay. Yes. So, I vote positive. Okay. And yes from me as well. Great. So um, it's 710 now. And so um, for the open space related items, um, the folks from the um, historic walk in Cushman area, um, that would be the first item for that. Okay, so for people from the public who are here, you'll notice that we do have a fairly long and full agenda. And so when your item comes up, and this is an open meeting, you're welcome to stay as long as you want, participate in everything, please do. We strongly encourage that. Um, but specifically when your piece is up, and if there is one person who is presenting it, um, we'll ask for that person first to raise their hand, we'll make them a panelist and they can present. And then we will go through discussions and then we definitely will open up each and every one to a public um, discussion. So we definitely wanna get everybody's comments. So is there anyone here who is presenting on the historic walk project? Okay, so Meg, I see you. And so Meg, you will be a panelist in just a sec and Jessica as well. Oops, a panelist. And Jessica as well. Yep, and she is on her way in. And so Jessica or Meg, um, would one of you like to give a brief background on the project and where we are at this point? And so we have heard parts of this Great. in the past, I believe. So this is really a chance to brief you. We're not asking for anything, uh, but because it's on con this historic uh, interpretive trail idea is on conservation land, we wanna be sure you know about it and hopefully we, you like it. <laughs> um, the, the goal is to research the many, many mills uh, and small factories that went along the, the Mill River, uh, really from the, where the current 
Rec Mill River Park is mm -hmm. all the way to Cushman Common. Except for Cushman Common, it's entirely on conservation land. So that's of interest to everyone at this meeting. Mm -hmm. um, by 1775, it's estimated there were already six mills along the river. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there are a number of remaining uh, cellar holes and dams. Uh, I don't know if you've ever noticed when you're at uh, the Mill River Park, to the north side, there's this berm. It looks like a high hill, but it's actually the outside of a canal that went from the river all the way along that edge and then around the corner up to the um, uh, grist mill that's now the home. Uh, so our goal is to research what was there and to uh, build an interpretive trail. Our original proposal <laughs> to the CPA was a little grand and that I think, uh, you know, we talked about engaging the community and community archaeology and um, we have pictures which I should have prepared and maybe when Jessica's speaking, I'll go find them of people who've looted or whatever you want to call it, um, found things there that are ancient, very old uh, coins and relics um, that they're taking away. Um, I think of it as looting, although they're thinking of it as kind of amateur historian research, I'm sure. Um, but our goal is to try to protect the sites and to protect and to create a sense of um, what happened in North Amherst uh, over the years between when this town was first colonized through almost the beginning of the 20th century. We hope to have uh, signage. Uh, we will have signage. I got to be more positive here. We will do this and uh, with QR codes, which allow you to link into all sorts of additional information like websites. And one of our hopes is that we'd have students involved who might uh, be the voices when you go on the QR code that you hear high school students or middle school students describing the families that lived there and what they produced and what their lives were like. Um, so we think North Amherst is one of the great treasures of our town and we are eager to uh, find more ways of celebrating. Maybe I'll hand it over to Jessica. Yep, and um, just one second. So we're getting some feedback on the line. And so if you're not speaking at, at a given point, if you could mute your microphone. That'd be it might be my husband listening to the news. I will, oh, Okay. but I will mute. So I'm inviting Jessica, sorry, thank you for that the feedback i mean the good feedback thank you for telling me that brett <laughs> about feedback feedback on the feedback um i'll hand it over to jessica to make a few additional comments and i'll mute right um one of the things that we love about north amherst is its rich history um and we want to help people who are currently zooming through north amherst um to have a reason to stop and um, provide them with a rich um, experience while they're in the town. This will, um, you know, provide them with a walk in the woods and, uh, you know, a, a little bit of a history um, hit, if, if you will. Um, but we could all, but this will help um, build up the local economy. There's a quite within a half a mile of North Amherst. There are quite a few people living, um, and many, many of them already walk in the conservation area. Um, and so uh, we would also be drawing on those people who are current fans um, to form a committee that will help to um, enact the, uh, the trail and then take care of it. Um, we don't expect the Conservation Commission to have to take over the responsibility for the maintenance of the trail, we we expect that it will be a community um, effort, and so that's part of our planning. Can I ask a question? I was able oh, to sorry. find this picture of some of the stuff that's been found on the site and dug up and taken home, old coins. Uh, it's really it's really uh, cool in a way, but also kind of horrible. Yeah. Uh, if you're into archaeology and preserving um, history, we're going to approach this approach this woman who gathered these things and 
hopefully create a, an exhibit at the Jones or somewhere of, of uh, what she's found. Mm -hmm. But I remember, it's, you know, we've changed our attitude around digging and finding old things. I remember as a kid, we used to go to the Connecticut River and dig around and find arrowheads. And, you know, that was a really great thing and we'd bring them into school. But it's actually not a great thing because uh, we're just up in <laughs> precious history. You know, we didn't know. So we were 12 and 10. But um, we, we think our community in North Amherst is, um, cares about history and that they'll want to protect this resource. But sure you had a question? Yeah, all right. Um, where, you say, where is this trail you're talking about? <clears throat> It's so, where, I haven't seen any of the plans, sorry. So I'm a little, maybe I'm late in the game here. But. It, it will be on the, oh, what is it? The name of the... the, the, the it goes from um, from the Mill River Park and the right. uh, Julius Lester Trail. Julius Lester, thank you. And then it goes um, up by Puffers and it goes out to Cushman on, um, I think it's still, it's still the Julius Lester Trail. Oh, so it's existing trails. Yes, oh, totally existing conservation trails. Got it. And Got there's it. one little spur when I've spoken with David about it, he yeah. there's in order to get to the dam that created the canal, you have to go a little just before if you're on Mill River Park recreation area and you're approaching the bridge to go into the woods to the left, you walk down there a very short distance. And there's actually people have made a little trail. You can see the dam that was uh, built to create the canal that went that took water um, up to the yeah. Chris Mill. Cool. Have you ever talk, spoken to uh, Steve Puffer at all? Well, we've Steve Puffer's not you alive. Know, We're working very closely with Barbara Puffer Garnier. Yeah, yeah. Um, he used to tell me about. He used to walk down to the blacksmith shop where Cushman yeah. Market used to, is now. So I'm like, yeah, Barbara, <laughs> Barbara's cool. very Barbara's very enthusiastic. We can send you a yeah. letter she wrote in support of this. She lives in France, but she comes back a lot. Um. Oh. Can I add to what Meg and Jessica have been have been saying? Because I think that um, it's it's just worth noting when this came to CPA, uh, it was not it, it was not concert. I wasn't the I wasn't the reason that it didn't go through. I think um, I, I you know I think my questions for for Meg and Jessica were and and their group were really around what you just asked right around like is it existing trail or not and. And yet the only the only part I think, if I'm not mistaken, is that part where where kind of a natural path has occurred that was not built by by conservation folks by the dam. Um, and so just to kind of bring to folks attention, you know, what what I was told was there was no digging. There's no you know, like this is not supposed to be a disruptive project. Um, and it's really more about ensuring that these sites don't further slip into decay. Um, and so from our end, just so people know, like it's not. Um, I guess I, I think that it's a really great project. I think that it's really nice to see the community coming behind it in a, in a strong way as well. Um, my, my questions are around that one piece of kind of not intentional or well, not created intentionally path. Um, and then, um, but yeah, just, just to let folks know, like this is hopefully coming back to CPA soon. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing it again. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. The little mini path that Anna's talking about is goes from just before the bridge as you approach the woods. Uh, it's about a hundred foot little it's, Oh, it's not even that. It's 10 or 50. It's like 10 or 20 feet. It's really very short. To so. go down to see the dam. Yeah, so I too just want to express my support. I think that this is a great idea. Love seeing people use the conservation land. Love people seeing doing more historical stuff. Hmm. Uh, my main question is just, and maybe this is something that's going to be happening afterwards, is what's going to be added to the conservation trails? Like how many signs, what will the signs look like? I think that's still in development, but that would be my concern or my I, concern, but question. Are you familiar with the story walk mm -hmm. that's in there now? It will be about like that. It, you know, we can't, we haven't designed anything yet, but it's not... It's, they're not going to be giant, you know, tables of information. That's why the QR codes are a, are a key um, feature because we don't want to have intrusive um, signs. We want them to be explanatory, but and and provide a link to more information. But we don't want to get them in anybody's way. 
Right. And actually, yeah, think... the part of the trail from Mill River to Puffers has fewer sites than the part above Puffers to Cushman. Mm -hmm. Because most of the sites were on the Summer Street side and they've just been totally destroyed. You know, they don't exist anymore. I think a question I have along the, the signage um, sort of a conversation is, you know, um, what's the plan for maintaining the signs if they get destroyed, if they get damaged? Um, who's responsible for that and just making sure that there's budget for that? Um, I think we'd be responsible. Uh, totally, you know, our District 1 Neighborhood Association would be responsible. And the committee that yeah. would be more, you know, more directly in charge. Mm -hmm. We're creating, yeah, so, mm -hmm. Jessica, maybe say a little more about, we're creating a, neighbor, a community committee, sort of non-governmental committee though, <laughs> <laughs> to, yeah. uh, to feel, uh, to, to supervise it and walk right. on it and maintain it. And, right, great. It'll be all the dog walkers. <laughs> Good. That's great. We found some amazing people who, you know, archaeologists coming out of the woodwork. It's pretty amazing. <laughs> and so one thing that we would be looking for is before anything is finalized. Um, and so I think today is just sort of informational and we really appreciate you um, approaching us this way. But before anything is finalized, allowing us to get a chance to see the actual number of signs, where they're going to be, what the signs are going to look like. Sure. Sure, that's that's not an, anything that's imminent. We have to um, we have to identify the sites and you know just decide how to research and decide what the best display you know the best way to explain them. Just so it's down the road. Okay, um, not really, yeah. really. Yeah. Yeah. So Larry, you have a question, and then I'd like to hear from Dave to see you know from the town perspective. But Larry, you had a question first. Oh, Larry, you're on mute. My question is, who has, who has final control over the signage and what it says? Is that, is that coming to our, our, our or the towns or is it up to them? We don't, we're happy to do whatever works for everybody. I mean, typically it's conservation land. And so we have final say in my opinion. Uh, I mean, granted, you know, we're not gonna wordsmith it. We're I agree, not gonna, that's why I asked the question. Remember Blue Meadow? Yeah. That's fine with us. There's some words nothing going on. <laughs> uh, after I said that, yeah. And... <laughs> that's, fine. that's fine with us. I we're, think Dave could uh, probably want... fill us in on what's gonna what would happen. Pardon? Fletcher? Yeah, no, I think I, I think this is a great um, uh, conversation we're having and and I, you know I too am supportive of the project as it as it moves forward. Um, and it'll be up to CPA to decide eligibility and all of that. Um, <clears throat> I think these are all good questions for, for Meg and, and Jessica. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I see this quite differently than the storybook uh, project. There are similarities, but uh, to be honest, I see that as a temporary installation. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I don't think that has the longevity that these would have. And so I think as, as Meg and Jessica and others think about a budget for this project. I mean, I do think, um, you know, Laura's questions about um, maintenance, we really need to on the, on the front side of this, think about um, what the signs are made of, both the posts as well as the signs themselves. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes what happens in, in these projects is the applicant or the, the, the contractor, um, or the town, whoever might be, or the federal or state government, if it's at a park or a historic park, they'll order multiple copies of the sign uh, in case of vandalism. But even the choice of, um, of um, material is very important. And what it is covered with or covered by or protected by is really important. You know, if, the, if a storybook uh, post, and, and I was just up there this weekend, I just sent some photos to Aaron, um, if you haven't seen the storybook walk, it's really it's really quite nicely done. Yeah. But if one if one of those gets damaged, you're really talking about a, you know, there'll be a little work involved, but you're probably talking about less than fifty dollars to replace a post and a and a, and the the attached uh, uh, signboard, if you will. But you know, if one of these 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 I see as a permanent installation uh, as part of the historic. Um, nature and, and, and the historic um, Cushman Brook and Mill River. Um, 
Um, so, so those are some of my thoughts, but I am very supportive. I do think Meg and Jessica, the more we really need, we have some experience with um, volunteer trail development and sign development, and it's been a mixed bag. Um, and so I, <laughs> I think we've, we've learned some lessons. So I, I do think that the commission uh, who is really the town and, and has care and control uh, function over conservation land really needs to be involved all the way through. And, and there might be a liaison even, you know, certainly staff would be involved, but there might be a liaison from the commission who is, is with you and us every step of the way. Uh -huh. That would be fabulous. Or join our committee. That would be great. Wouldn't and, it? We'd love that. Um, yes, yes. I've already signed my husband up. <laughs> He's going to be on the committee. <laughs> and I mean, so there are professionals, There, it is a, a profession out there of interpreters. Yeah. Um, nature or history or historical interpreters. And so if it's possibility of building it into the budget to have some of them, you know, we're all very well intentioned, but it's hard to design a, a good sign that is robust enough yet simple enough. And right. right. It's really interesting. The advice we're getting is, do you really have to pay somebody for that? Can't one of you do that? Or <laughs> you should really hire a professional who knows what they're doing on a, on a number of points. Like the archaeologist, you really need an archaeologist anyway. It's but I'm we're we want to do this properly with the right, uh, just what uh, what you said, Brett. We wrote something for you that unfortunately we didn't send until last night, and you might not have had a chance to see it. But I know um, Aaron's going to send it to you, and you can it'll fill you in. I'm aware you have it's a uploaded on the OneDrive, so folks can look at it. It's a memo. Um, and then there's another document, which was the original document that, that we yeah, had provided. We, we that the, we've modified our, the original project was a little grandiose because we, we laid out our whole vision about community archaeology and um, high school students being involved. And really the CPA just wants to fund research to preserve the rocks. Um, so the proposal that you, the, the memo that we wrote to you that we sent last night is Paired, dramatically pared down, but we can still, after we get this research done, we can engage uh, high school students in the community and uh, so on. And we just, we just add, we, we've got a couple of, of examples. We've got the story walk, uh, the storybook walk at, in, along the, um, the, um, the Mill River. Really? We, have, we now have in storage, we do have the Bluebird Meadow signs. They have arrived and we have them. Um, we also have signs that Beth Wilson developed uh, for the Fort River uh, uh, Fearing Brook project. And so, you know, it might be um, beneficial for all of us to, you know, and I can take some photographs of those, um, um, you know, uh, in, in storage, take them out of the boxes. Many of them are out of the boxes anyway, and, and share them with Meg and Jessica and the commission to, to give you an idea. Um, there's a wonderful, a, a pretty nice uh, sign um, example, I think, up in Turner's Falls along the old historic canal. And those are fairly simple. They're probably three by four. I, I, I can't recall, but they were part of a project I worked on many years ago up there at the Great Falls Discovery Center. So that's a nearby example of, of some well done natural history interpretation signs. And, and they're on... Um, uh, I think they're on some sort of aluminum or wrought iron um, posts. They're nicely done. We're, so, we're also going to take a, a field trip in the better weather to Acton because they have yes. um, put in place a trail very much like the one that we want to mm -hmm. establish um, in their conservation land along the Neshoba Brook um, with uh, both um, First peoples and um, early settler remains. So, so my apologies, but I'm going to try and move us along. So we have a lot of other things <laughs> on the agenda, and I mean this is really deep and extremely interesting. But I think we could talk about it for a long time. And so, what's important? I want to open it up to the public. I see your hand as well, Larry, um, and then make sure that we have a path forward. And so, first, I just want to see if there's anybody from the public. Um, so you can just use that little raise hand icon if you have any comments. I don't see any. So Larry, did you have something? My main thing was that I really like this project, but my main, my main concern is that it be done well, because I think this is significant to the town. 
Brett, there was a hand. I, it went away, but if you want to ask again and maybe give it a little bit longer. Maybe not. Raise your hand. Name was Patricia, I think, that raised her hand. I don't know. Yep. Okay. So I don't don't see anything at this point, but yeah, if you do have something, please. Um, so path forward. Um, so this was kind of informational tonight, which is again, extremely helpful. Thank you. Um, and so you will be developing your proposal. And so, um, yeah, it'd be great if you can be in touch with either Dave or Aaron and they can definitely sort of fill us in. If there is somebody from the CONCOM who is, you know, passionate about this and would love to work on this, you know, that would be great. Um, but yeah, I mean, we all have a lot of other things going on as well, I understand. One question I have is that we are um, possibly going to hire an archaeologist to do site surveys. Is there any permitting that we need to have take care of before he goes in and starts measuring and photographing and things like that? Are they going to be disturbing earth or will it be non-invasive? Non-invasive. Non this, we, we know there's a permit we need from the state, which is because it's non-invasive, but is there a permit from the town that we need? Brett, if I could suggest that this could be handled through your, you know, the, the form, the activity form that, that anyone fills out if they'd like to use conservation areas for a wedding or a research, uh, I think you, the commission could handle it that way. It is non-invasive as long as it doesn't involve digging or removing stones or anything else. I think it could be handled that way. Right. Okay. Yeah, it's a pretty simple form, very pro forma. So there's not going to be any issues with that as long as it's on the town website. The form is on the town website. Yep, or um, get in touch with Aaron as well. Yeah, okay. if, uh, if you shoot me an email, I can send it to you. Great. OK. Thank you. Thank you so much. Very much. So just one final call to the public, because so I count five. OK, we're good. So my apologies thank if I cut anything off. Before. Everybody. So thank you both. And yeah, we look forward to seeing this uh, in the future. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye -bye. Thank you, everybody, so much. Bye-bye. So um, I just wanted to jump in really quickly. There was another um, person who had submitted, um, who was supposed to be, um, I guess, presenting or, or um, putting in a request tonight um, related to some um, graduate research that they were doing and wanted to use conservation land and talk about it with the board. I don't see them in the attendee list, so I'm not sure that they're, I don't think they're here tonight, but I did put the request, the written request in the Dropbox so that you guys could familiarize yourself with it because I don't think that they're in attendance tonight. Okay, um, can we just verify? So if you are here for that, can you just use the little raise hand thing? And I had some questions about that one, but if they're not here, I guess we can talk about it after we get through our normal, our normal yeah. piece. Yeah, and I'll, I'll, they, you know, were, I sent the information for the meeting tonight, but um, maybe just fell through or whatever. So I'll follow up with them and um, maybe at the next meeting they could present. Okay, sounds good. Okay, so I have 734. So I think that we are okay to move forward with our, what's listed as 730 on our agenda. Um, and this is a notice of intent for 84 East Leverett Road. So if, if you're a part of that, if you wanna raise your hand and I will formally open this. This hearing is being held as required by the provisions of chapter 131, section 40 of the general laws of the Commonwealth and act relative to the protection of wetlands as most recently amended in the town of Amherst protection bylaw. This is a notice of intent that is being presented by Meredith Orenstein for Joseph Aimua for construction of single family home, well and septic outside a resource area. Proposed driveways located in 200 foot riverfront area to Cushman Brook. The address is 84 Leverett Road, map 3C, lot 12. Okay, so Meredith, I see you. You are now a panelist. And then Deborah, I see you. So we might just want to make sure that we're distinguishing between the folks who are presenting versus people from the public who have comment on this, because um, just just to make that clear, because I think that there's a number of abutters who might be present. 
Okay. Yep. Thank you. So yeah. So what we're looking for is only people. So Meredith is, do you know if there's anybody else here who is presenting or are these, Deborah, are you presenting or Deborah a presenter? Do you know? Aaron? I think, I, I think um, the, the last name uh, AIMUA on the um, attendee list might be. Um, okay. That yeah. should be the yeah. Uh, Joseph. Okay, so I see Deborah's hand up, so I'm just going to let Deborah in. Sometimes people have different names, but we can just check real quick. Um, so Deborah, you should be able to speak now. Are you part? Are you presenting, or are you just? Uh, I'm uh, in a butter. Okay, so I'm going to kick you back out, and you'll be. Hi. So, but Hi. please. Hi. Hi. <laughs> okay, and. Do, do, do. There's somebody else with their hand up. So Patricia, I think, is in the same boat. So, okay. So uh, Meredith, do you want to go ahead and um, present for us? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, and I was wondering, can I share my screen eventually? You okay, because I have um, a plan to show, and I also have some photos I can show everybody. Yeah, I'm you just going to make a button on the bottom of the screen that says share screen. Oh yeah, okay, it's like regular Zoom now, okay. Can you hear me okay? I think I lost, okay. No, we can hear you okay. It looks like you're searching for the buttons and- Okay, sorry. <laughs> this whole Zoom thing is getting used to it. Okay, so let me, I'm gonna share my, I'm gonna share a plan um, so you can see what we're talking about here. Let's see if this works. Now, can you guys see if I jump around from plan to plan? Yes. Okay, can. perfect. Okay, because we have revised the plans a few times. So this is the most updated plan. We actually updated it today with a minor revision that I'll talk about in a few minutes. But first of all, um, my name is Meredith Borenstein. I filed this notice of intent on behalf of Joseph Amwa. He's the... Um, applicant, the engineer, and the contractor for this project. There he is. Um, I'm a wetland scientist and I'm doing this um, for myself actually. So, so this project is for a single family home located at 84 East Leverett Road. You probably know this, pro uh -oh, I'm getting a lot of feedback. So it's right now, if you can I think Joseph, you need to mute. Okay, I'm not used to this. I've tried to. Okay, Meredith, so you should be unmuted at this point. Oh, thank you. Uh, we should be good to go. Okay, I'm gonna try that again. So back to my plan. Um, so you, um, sorry. So this lot is located across the street from Cushman Brook over here. Um, there is an existing egress here and I'll show you some photos in a few minutes that will be utilizing or they'll be utilizing to access the lot. Um, only the driveway is located in the riverfront area. The house and the septic system will be located outside of all resource areas. So, so during construction to protect the resource areas, we will be installing a compost filter tube around the entire limit of work here. Um, there will be a 30 foot, 30 foot gravel wash pad to collect any sediment as trucks are going in, in and out of here. Um, also, there is a there is an existing catch basin. Where is it? Here it is. That re currently receives any um, water from the driveway. So that will be protected with a silt sack and then um, 
filter tubes or hay bales around that. Um, this is also, this will have double protection because there is grass, then there'll be a compost filter tube, and then there's the driveway and then the catch basin. So it ha will have double protection there. Um, so as they're putting in the driveway, there'll be some minor excavation um, to get the foundation and the driveway in and any soil stockpiles that, that come out of that will be stored up here outside of resource areas and will ultimately be used you know, around the house to kind of level out this area, but it's mostly flat up there. Um, we did a site walk today and, and I thought that was really helpful. Um, there is a small wetland located over here, but we're gonna be outside of the 100 foot buffer zone, which is this line here. Um, we also noted there is an intermittent stream on this north side of the property. And we measured, and I believe we came up with, was it 160 feet about, it might've been more. 160 to the property line. And then it was an additional, I think 30 feet to the work area. Okay, thank you. And then there was, there's actually a hump here. You can kind of see it in the contours. There's a hump here. So um, I'm very confident that this stream, we're well away from it and it will be protected by the natural topography out there. So really minor tree clearing back here outside of any buffers or riverfront area. Um, really the reason we're here is because we're here tonight is because we're located in the 200 foot riverfront area and we are complying with the regulations. Um, we're doing that by one and we, um, we received DEP comments and one of their comments was this needs to be 10% this driveway needs to be 10% of the riverfront area on the lot. So we um, decreased the width of the driveway from 13 feet to 10 feet. And that got us down to, um, originally we were looking at 1700 square feet of impacts. And now we're looking at 1483 feet, uh, square feet. So, Another um, way we're complying with the regulations is that because we're working in the riverfront area, we're going to do, we need to do some mitigation. So we're going to propose some native shrubs over here, sort of um, between the, the neighbors over here at 66 East Leverett Road. And then the, this is all grass right now. So I'm proposing um, some shrubs there. I was thinking shadbush, witch hazel, and um, dogwood, something to give it some color, I think in there would be nice. And so we're open to suggestions on the native plantings that the commission um, would like to see in there. I wasn't going to propose any seed because it's already grassed. So I wasn't sure if seed would take, but we could, we could do a wildlife seed mix in there too. So I think I think that covers the majority of what we're proposing out there. And um, I don't know if we, you'd like to, the commission has questions or I can show some photos. Should I do the photos? The photos yeah. would be great because my I didn't get too many of them on site. And Okay, yeah, I took a bunch. So hang, let me see. All right, here, here we go. Okay, can you guys see that photo? Yes. Okay, so this is, um, East Lever Road over here. This is the existing catch basin, existing driveway. This goes up to 86 East Lever, which is the neighbor to the north. So let me just uh, see if I, why can I scroll through? Oh, there we go. Okay, so these aren't in order, but um, let, this is the proposed, this is the, let me try to get a better picture to orient you guys. The existing houses, I'm sure everybody knows this, this location. As you drive by, you can see these houses on the road there. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so let's start here. This is um, me standing in East Leverett Road, looking up towards the existing driveway here. So this is gonna be the egress. Then the driveway will come up the slope between these trees and the house would be located kind of at the top of the hill there. So let, now if I scroll through, it might make a little, oops. This is the proposed planting area. The native plantings will be in here. Here's a better picture of that. So that would provide sort of a buffer between the neighbor 
neighboring house and um, the driveway there. Again, driveway location, looking up this stake is sort of where the house will be up here. Um, house location, oops, now I'm gonna have to scroll backwards, sorry. Okay, so house and then looking back towards where the leach field is proposed. And now this is where the perk, this is a perk test tube looking down. This is where Leachfield would be proposed and the house over here looking down towards East Lover Road. Leachfield location, Leachfield location and then back to the catch basin. I had some better photos in my notice of intent. Um, if folks show a couple more photos and then I'll stop. Where did it go? Oh, here we go. Let's see. Can you guys see that? Yes. Okay. So again, driveway, where it's going. Um, probably a lot of the same, but I thought they were kind of a better angle. You know, the driveway is going to come up through here and then the house will be facing out. Oh, I'm sorry. There's actually going to be a garage at the at ground level, but it's just going to be, and then the house will be on top of that, of the garage. Sorry. Yeah, these are some of the same photos, just a different time of year. So let me stop sharing. I think that covers everything. If you guys have questions. Yeah, thank you very much, Meredith. So thank Aaron, you. do you have some pieces that you would like to kick off with? Yeah, so um, just to, you know, kind of sum up with the board that I've had some communication with um, several abutters that are um, down slope of this site. And there were some concerns raised as far as water um, and I, I did upload several documents to the Dropbox, which contain a butter comments and questions. And I tried to respond to all of them, but I wanted to make sure that you guys knew that they were there so you could view them. Um, so just to kind of summarize really briefly the um, conditions that I would recommend to try to um, mitigate some of the concern. Um, and and again, a lot of these are outside of our jurisdiction related to the house, but asking the applicant to focus downspouts from the house um, to the north side of the house and preferably into some kind of like French drain system so that it can infiltrate up on top of the hill. Now I understand even at the toe of the slope, groundwater is four feet deep. So um, because of the location of the river, you know, there, there is a relatively low groundwater table there, even though the neighbors do experience water issues. So just to kind of um, recap on that. Um, so the downspouts being, being dealt with dealing with any runoff from the house up on the hill, as opposed to directing it down the slope. Um, also, I would recommend that the driveway be sheet flowed to the north side of the site. And preferably into some kind of a grassed swale, like a very, um, you know, uh, low um, gradient grassed swale so that any runoff can be um, gathered in that swale and then run downhill toward the catch basin that's at the toe of the slope. And then um, one of the concerns that was raised was regarding um, if there were any groundwater seeps in the hillside because the way that construction is going to work, and again, it's outside of our jurisdiction, but um, they're carving into the hill to, to put the garage in, and the garage will be lower than, and so the garage will go in, and then it'll be a four foot lift into the basement, and then the main floor of the house is on the second floor. So they're doing quite a bit of cut and fill, and then backfilling the back of the house. And so if they hit a groundwater seep in the course of constructing the driveway or the house that um, they would have to come up with some kind of a plan to mitigate that. And 
I've seen this happen in the past on hillsides where they um, install like a French drain system and a French drain system could be filtered into that same swale if that condition arises where water is coming out very, very rare and not super likely, but if it happened, we could condition it so that they would have to deal with it and come back to us. Um, another comment that was received that I think was a really important one was that the initial plan set that we received had been completed by a surveyor and it was signed and stamped. The plan that we've received um, this time around doesn't have a stamp or a signature on it. And um, it does appear that the wetland flagging was possibly picked up via survey or maybe it was shared CAD data. But the riverfront area flags, if you look at the plan, they appear to be in the center line of the river. And we actually approved flagging um, at the top of bank. So I wanted to make sure that that wasn't a graphics issue and that the flagging was actually picked up along the top of bank for Cushman Brook and that that was being accurately reflected in the um, distance offset to the 200 foot riverfront area. Um, and, in, and also just to make sure that the applicant knows that we will need for the final plan, the plan set will need to be stamped and signed by architect, landscape architect, surveyor, um, somebody who's signing off on the accuracy of all of the, the points that are being provided on the plan. Thank you, Erin. And so just as a reminder, we've been out there on this property before. I don't know if people remember, and I don't remember how long ago that was, Aaron, maybe a year or two when we did the initial delineation. So if you weren't it, out there for here, you were, you may have been out there for that as well. Yep. Um, yeah, and I'd also just want to reiterate what you started off with, Aaron. And so just for the applicants and everybody, um, we as a CONCOM, as the, you know, wetlands um, commission, we have certain jurisdiction um, and we have no jurisdiction outside of that area. We can provide recommendations, but um, for those who are here from the public with, we're happy to talk about um, everything that's within our jurisdiction, but some of those other comments will need to be brought in front of, I assume zoning, Aaron, or who would they talk to about that? Um, so a couple of the questions should go to Board of Health related to the, um, the leach field up on the hill. And then there was also some questions about the house design um, which those would be building inspector, or they could speak to, you know, the applicant directly to get the design plan. Um, the other thing is that um, the, the question with water runoff is kind of a tricky one from a conservation commission perspective. We certainly can do what we can, um, but the building inspector also has an authority as far as reviewing plans and making sure that landowners are not displacing water from their property onto a neighbor's property. So that's also written into the building code. So that's something that, um, you know, discussing with the building inspector would be a really good thing to do. And I also advise them, you know, if you're concerned about water, start documenting now, take pictures seasonally of, you know, the conditions that are outside, because if all of a sudden after construction, you have pools of water that are forming all around your house, it's good to have documentation. And that's just for your own personal, you know, um, protection. So those are kind of all conversations that we've had. Yeah. And um, we're not trying to shirk any responsibilities here. We're just trying to, you know, let people know, um, you know, what we have purview over. Um, also, as always, if you have any questions about which board to, um, to talk to, you know, um, Aaron or Dave can help point you in the right direction as well. So, okay, so um, how we're gonna run this is we will open it up to the commissioners first. And so we'll go through a round or two of comments. So we'll see if people have any questions and then we will start opening it up to the public. Um, for those who are here from the public, if you can raise your hand as I see one person has now, please do that. And then um, once we come to the open comment period, uh, we'll call each person who has their hand up. Okay, um, so kind of like what I was saying before, I just want to start off with, um, you know, a lot of this work that's being done is outside of any resource area. So that's not really within, you know, our jurisdiction or our purview. The piece that's down towards the bottom 
And it's also a super steep slope on the other side down to Cushman Brook um, for what that's worth. Um, and so, but yeah, that part that's down towards the bottom, the beginning of the driveway, that's sort of the biggest, most direct concern that we have. Mm -hmm. Um, Brett, what's the, or do we, um, do we know what the driveway is going to be made of? Is it pervious or impervious material? So Meredith or? Yeah, I can answer that. It's going to be, so during construction, they're going to um, gravel it and, but ultimately it will be paved. Okay. But just for sedimentation issues, they don't want to leave it open and it, if, if we get approval and if this moves forward, we can't pave until April or something, so. And then um, are you planning to incorporate the swale and the Northern um, sheet runoff? That's the right word, right term that um, Aaron was using. Is that something you guys are doing, Meredith? We're planning on um, having the driveway pitch to the North, yes. And then um, it's all grass there now, so it was all, planning to be remain it's going to remain grass um and we would have to update to plant the plan to put like a formal grass swale in there but ultimately everything will go back to being vegetated um and i think the area is naturally um sloped to the north there i think pull up the plan yeah, I think it'll naturally form almost a basin if you're raising the driveway up a little bit and then leaving the existing grass area on the other side. Um, but I mean, there's no harm in putting a little indicator on there that it's going to be maintained um, for the purpose of you know, capturing water. And mm -hmm. Yeah, I think a note should be added to the plan that says, you know, driveway pitch to the north and so um, Brett, grass I, I have a question just as far as like precedent and history goes. I noticed like a lot of a lot of homes um, who presumably have driveways built within that same 200 foot buffer zone. Have, are those older homes or ha has this commission reviewed any of those plans in the past? I'm just wondering what precedent has been sort of set. Yeah, I mean, people are allowed access to property, you know, with it within due um, restrictions. I can't remember anything. I don't know if you can, Fletcher, anything specifically that's come before us during our tenure. A lot of those are older than, yeah. Got it. Got it. So, but yeah, I mean, they are there, but yeah, sometimes laws change and yeah, there's some stuff that people put in that we don't know how the hell they got allowed to, why they're allowed to do it. But. It probably was before wetlands protection. Yeah. Yeah, that's like the houses that are. The houses you see that the house are across on. the street and like on the Cushman Brook. Yeah, I know. Right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Really nice though. That's quite nice. Well, Laura, to, to to your question, I mean, most of those houses along East Leverett Road predate the Rivers Protection Act, so mm. that's the simple answer. Yeah. Um, right. I don't know the date of that, Aaron. Do you know? August 6, nineteen ninety six. There we go. Approximately. Yeah. <laughs> I do have a, a question about conditioning. Um, and I, I, I know we've gone through this before, but actually I forget about impervious surfaces. Um, is that something we can request? I know it's sometimes it's actually not, I know many times it's not even feasible, um, but for this particular section, does it matter? Does it work? I don't know, but is that something we can, something to consider? Yeah, definitely something we can ask about. So, yeah. I mean, Meredith or Aaron, do you see any issues or um, will it work? Oh, are you asking? I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. Are you, are you guys asking if it can be pervious rather than impervious? So we're looking for very often we'll right. ask yeah. impervious pavers or something along those lines as a alternative to simply paving over. Um, I don't have a problem with that. I don't know if um, Joseph wants to speak to that. He's um, also the contractor in using pervious pavers. I think it's just a matter of maintenance um, and it is on a hill there. Can you pay, can you pave pervious, um, those pavers? Or is that something you kind of maintain by shoveling 
I'm just thinking of snow snow removal. You mean can you plow them? Plow them. Sorry, <laughs> you can't pay. You don't pay. Yeah, you rivers. you can plow them okay. carefully. Um, they also have to be um, after winter storms. They have to be maintained um, using sort of like a best management practice where they you know you might sweep sweep sediment that accumulates in between the um, the pavers to make sure that they're still infiltrating properly. Um, I do think on the hillside slope like that, it, they might be challenging for a plow, um, catching edges and things of, because they're, they're essentially, it's like, you know, bricks. But, um, but I mean, if it's something that the applicant is willing to consider, then, you know, I think all options are on the table for, you know, requests, so. Oh, no, you're on mute. Nope, still on mute. Uh-oh. Yeah, I can unmute. Uh. What we say? Wait, one sec, one sec. Uh, asked to unmute. You're muted, Joseph. I don't know. I can only ask to unmute. So Joseph, if you hover over your face on the screen in, in the top right hand corner, there should be an unmute in a little blue uh, button right over your face on the screen. Nope, no good yet. Oh wait, I think, nope. no. The, the host should be able to unmute, no? We can mute people, we can't unmute them. Oh, I see. <laughs> Which makes sense. Yeah. That's fair enough. Right at the sign. Yeah. Like so. Email them some? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think we should get too hung up on it if, if, uh, if we can figure it yeah, out as sure. we go on. Maybe we should yeah. keep moving on with questions and then. Agree. Sure. Okay. Uh, uh, I guess uh, I, 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 I do um, have one more question about the mitigation. Um, and I just, I, I'm just for, for the commission, is that something that's, is that obviously doing like a replication, like a wetland, but like the mitigation, is that sufficient? You know, the, the plantings along that border of the, um, of the property line there? I don't know. I mean, riverfront, you got to do something. I see it seems good, but I don't know if there's like anything else that might be better. Yeah, to strengthen it. Yeah. There I mean, there's definitely going to be sheep flow coming off that hill. Yeah. Like there's going to be water coming in. I know those houses have wet basements. I know people used to live there. Like, yeah. it's, it's, those are wet basements there, but that's nothing we can do. But I wonder if that's that the best option we can do. There's also an existing wetland in one of the corners. I don't know if there's an option to sort of build off of that um, or do something with that and then actually increase some infiltration there. Not quite an ideal spot where that is, but. Yeah, I mean, if it was a, if there was wetland alteration taking place, I think allowing replication to be um, piggybacked on a wetland like that is a, is, is a, um, a good thing and that would probably be required but where this is riverfront area um you know i've talked with mark stinson about this because this was related to one of the dep comments um is you know converting lawn back to native vegetation is the preferred manner of riverfront restoration and um in this case what i had suggested was one-to-one -one. so like whatever the alteration was for the driveway to require that amount of mitigation for natural plantings. And those plantings would be conditioned to not be disturbed in perpetuity. So like somebody couldn't come in and tear them out and put in lawn in their place. They'd have to stay native, native area. Um, but the commission could require additional area of riverfront restoration as well. Additional square footage, I should say. And how, so, and the only way that it would be demarcated would obviously be on the deed, but we know that that does not always, it's not always seen. 
So <laughs> for the area, the native area, it would yeah. be conditioned in the order of conditions and then um, it would be an ongoing condition in the certificate of compliance that would be recorded on the property. But so sometimes we will ask for some demarcation, so stones or something like that, just to make sure it's not disturbed as well. Yep. Yeah. Mr. Chair, can I make a comment on that? Please. Um, would birdhouses be applicable once you decide how big? Because I also am concerned about that too, because it is adjacent to a lawn area that gets mown. Um, I don't know, something permanent, some sort of permanent marker. But yeah, signage, I don't know, really would fit in, wouldn't fit that well there. Yeah, we have conditioned um, birdhouses as long as they're on some sort of permanent stake type of thing before. Um, the stones are even more permanent. Okay. So it kind of depends on what you'd be proposing for the stakes, I think, is what it really comes down to. Okay. Yeah, so, stones may be, stones yeah. are, I think, would be, um, I guess it's up to the applicant. I shouldn't speak for him, but that's a good thing to consider to add to the plan. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so we definitely will need to see some additional stuff before we can approve it. So I don't think we're voting yeah. tonight anyways. Right. Um, plans need to get revised and all of that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So if you can come back with a proposal for next time on some sort of demarcation, that'd be great. And commissioners, any feeling on the amount? I mean, one to one, is that acceptable? Seems reasonable. Total was... 1,480 something square feet, right? Yeah, that seems reasonable. Okay, um, so I'm gonna go ahead and open it up for people who have comments from the public. So uh, at this point, Patricia, you should be able to unmute yourself and- Okay. So, yep, this is Robert uh, that's gonna be speaking. Yeah. Okay. Hi. So I, I live across the street and I own the east side of the road, the very steep bank that goes into the river. And I have two quick straightforward questions. One is I would request that the wetlands would be clearly demarcated on the proposed housing map because I feel it's being uh, pretty vague right now. And secondly, I would like to question the reference point used to calculate the 100 foot, 200 foot buffered zone, because by the map, it's in the middle of the river. And I have read that it's a real estate law that it should be the edge of the river. So that's substantially 20, 25 feet difference we're talking here. Thank you. Yep, and fully agree with you, Robert. Yeah, so that's something that needs to be, particularly that second point needs to be corrected. That's not acceptable how it is. And so on the revised plans, that will need to be something that happens. And the area being of impact, it will need to be recalculated and the replication area would have to be adjusted accordingly as well. Okay. But just um, to clarify, Brett, it sounded like there was question as to whether the current delineation is off the bank or off the center line. So it could be that it remains the same. We just need clarification on that. Okay, good point, Jen. So yeah, we need to make sure that, and you are right, Robert, it is off of the um, bank. And should so be off of the top of bank. We don't know if currently it's from 200 feet from the top of bank or 200 feet from the center line of the river and that needs to be clarified. Correct, and fixed if need be. Um, and then the other point that you're bringing up, Robert, about the wetlands lines. Um, yeah, so if there's any wetlands that are not on there, if those can be made clearer, um, that would be important as well. Thank you. And so, Robert, I think you have your hand up still. Do you have another question? Oh, no, I'm done. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, our so, hand's down now. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, I will actually lower your hand. So there we go. Thank you very much. And so, Brian. Okay. Okay, I should be my my hair. We can hear you. Correct. Excellent. Um, 
Okay, I, we just have two quick questions. We live right next door at 66. Um, and last year we looked to purchase this lot. Um, and so related to that is two things. One is that the lot has changed pretty dramatically. It was uh, 0.7 acres then, and this lot looks to be uh, 1.1 it was saying. So we just, this might be a question for, for Dave about the status of what this lot is and if the new borders have been approved. Um, and what the process is on that. I can just touch on that briefly. Um, so my understanding is that the, the applicant went through um, approval not required for the original lot boundary, but, and then filed, uh, and then the notice of, a notice of intent was filed earlier in 2020. And when we began review of that um, application that was submitted, DEP would not issue a file number on it. And I also, um, there, was, there was substantial issues with it because of the amount of alteration that was proposed in the riverfront area. Um, and so I had a conversation with the owner and um, the consultant at the time. And I think the consensus was that they were, they're exploring the basically um, reconfiguration of the lot to see if this house could be permitted with the new configuration, but they don't want to permanently change the lot boundary until they know that they're going to get the house approved because carving up the lot again um, and going through the legal procedure to do that if they don't know that they're going to be granted a permit to put in the house. So they just wanted to go through this process before they do that to make sure that it's feasible. Okay, and what, when that would happen, would there be more, I mean, what, I guess, does that just go through a, a zoning process or a planning board to? <clears throat> That's a good question. And I, um, I'm assuming it would just be an, a revision of the approval not required, okay. which would be um, a planning board or zoning board sign off, but I'm not, um, super super familiar with the procedures. Um, I think it would just be a revision, but that would be something that we would need to get clarification from another department okay. on. Okay, thanks. And then, so the second part of this is that when, um, you know, we had looked to purchase it and in the process of that, we had an inspector come to look at the land and that is actually when the current wetland designations were made. Um, so prior to that in 2019, the wetlands in the back um, or in the, uh, the southwest corner of that property were not designated as wetlands yet. Um, and so if this, so I guess going forward, looking to see if this house could be built on the proposed site, um, would there be another inspection of that land? Because at the time in 2019, it seemed like we could, like a house could be built in what is now designated as a wetland. And if that hadn't been inspected, we wouldn't have known that. So we just are wondering if the new site would have an inspection to look into any environmental issues. Yeah, and Brian, I mean, that's kind of the process that we went through. And so, um, yeah, that was very useful and very important for that initial site assessment to be done. And that's why we were out there or why that process went through and thank you if you're the one who sort of instigated that. Um, at that point, the lines are approved. And so they did come in front of the Conservation Commission and we did approve those lines. And we do that so that, you know, future, or the current landowner or future landowners know what their opportunities are. So that's kind of a, um, so that's kind of set for, you know, a given period of time at this point. So Aaron, do you have some additional clarification on that? Yeah, so, and just to touch on that a little bit more, um, when the initial delineation was completed, we, we did walk the entire site. We walked lots one and two. Um, and um, the, they were walked in their entirety and checked in their entirety. The, there was one area which is north of the existing two homes um, where there was a intermittent stream that flows in the back of the property and it um, goes down um, underneath um, East Leverett Road as well. Um, at the time, 
I brought that up to the landowner that there was a stream there and that there was actually flagging there at the time. And um, I said, you know, if you're going to confirm on lot one, you're going to need to include this. And at the time they made the determination of the decision not to include those flags. And so we only approved the delineation for lot two as it was shown in that configuration. When I was out there today, that was one of the things I was looking for was how, what is the proximity of that intermittent stream and the bordering wetlands on it to this work on the, in the new lot configuration. And the flagging was still there from the original delineation and we took a measurement and it was 160 feet from the wetland boundary to the property line and then another 30 feet to the proposed leach field um, to the north. So there's a significant offset back there where there's no, um, we're not in any proximity to a wetland on that side for what's proposed here. Um, and the, the area where the perk test was done and the house is situated um, are, are upland areas. So just to kind of address that holistically. Okay. Does, does that answer your questions, Brian? Um, yeah, that's if, if both the lots were covered, I guess the issue is since the lot had changed boundaries so much, we didn't know what had been reviewed. Yep. Okay. So thank you, Brian. Okay. Um, so are there any other questions from the public or anything else from the commission? Okay, so there are a couple of things that we have asked of the applicant. So we'll need to, you know, see some revisions and see all of this. Um, Aaron, can you give a proposed date and time for a continuation of this hearing? Yeah, so it would be um, the January 27th meeting and we could um, start the hearing at 730. And so is that enough time for the applicant to get together what you need to? Yes, absolutely. We'll we'll get those revisions as soon as possible to Aaron and be ready for the next meeting. Okay. So with that, we are looking for a motion. I move we continue this hearing to January 27th at 7.30 p.m. I second that. Okay, thank you. So voice vote, Larry. Yes. Laura. Aye. Anna. Aye. Jen. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Leroy. Aye. And I as well. So we will see you later this month. Have a beautiful okay. day. Okay. Thank you so much, you guys. Have a great night. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Okay. So just switching up roles here. Okay. So I think we are good. And so we are going to move on to our 735. Um, which is a request for determination. So let me get my paperwork here. And for those who, um, who are here, so this is the Amherst College one, if you could raise your hand and we will promote you to a panelist. I'll so be abstaining from this one as that is my employer. Okay, thank you. Okay, so this public meeting is now called to order. This meeting is being held as required by the provisions of chapter 131, section 40 of the general laws of the Commonwealth and act relative to the protections of wetlands as most recently amended in the town of Amherst wetlands bylaw. This is a request for determination being presented by Kenneth Lozier on behalf of Amherst College for replacement and repair of four footbridges on Amherst College property. Footbridges are located in wetlands and buffer zones within priority habitat areas at map 14D and lot one. Okay, so, so Kate, you should be able to go. Um, and I thought I saw Ken here before. Ken might show up as Julia. I betcha he is. Okay, promote to panelist. Okay, so oh, we can see even though it says UMass, I assume that's actually an Amherst College person. So, that is um, an Amherst College person, yes. <laughs> so Kenny or Kate, I'm not sure which one of you would like to present, but if you would like to provide an overview for us, that would be much appreciated. 
Absolutely. I will uh, start. Let me, there, yeah, that's a little bit better. A little less UMass. Um, <laughs> here, my, I hate headphones. Can you hear me? Yes. Can everybody hear me? Yes. yes. Perfect, good. Okay, so allow me to share screen. Okay. And can everybody see that? You're good. Excellent. Um, so just for and can you also uh, just reference point as to what we're looking at. Um, sorry, can, um, can you also just introduce yourself? Of site four, that's College Street running east to west. On the left side of the map is the railroad up and down the middle is the Eversource right of way. Um, I'm gonna toggle back and forth between this screen and some of the individual bridge descriptions we have pertaining to each individual site. Um, Kenny, I think Kenny, the original think... submittal, we're going to, oops, sorry, go ahead, Brett. Um, yeah, if you could just introduce yourself oh, real I'm quick. So Nobody can, you know I can't what your role hear. Is and... Now that I've got my headphones out, apologies, one sec. While Kenny is getting his headphones on, uh, let me just introduce myself if and... you can hear me. Sorry about that. Go ahead. Yep. So the request was if you can just um, introduce yourself so we know oh. who you're representing. <laughs> don't, don't just dive all the way in. Yeah. And then if, <laughs> if you could do the same, that'd be great. Yeah. So uh, Kenny Lozier, Supervisor of Landscape and Grounds at Amherst College. Thank you. And Kate Sims, I teach Economics and Environmental Studies at Amherst College. Thank you, Ken. And so, yeah, if you want to jump back in, that'd be great. Sure. Um, so I'm going to toggle back and forth between this screen and those individual bridge uh, pictures. Um, the original paperwork that we submitted with um, bridge, uh, altered bridge lengths, we are further altering um, so as to further remove bridges from any um, resource areas. Um, so I'll start with site one. Um, over here on the west side of the map, uh, closest to East Drive and Merrill Apartments on Amherst College campus. Um, so that is pictured here. Um, this picture is, let's see, we are standing on the north side facing south, um, just for reference point. Um, initially, we were planning on a more modest lengthening of this bridge, but after further inspection, we we believe uh, due to the erosion of this bank, um, it's probably best to lengthen it even further. All bridges are going to remain the same style that you see in these pictures. They're going to remain the exact same width um, and they will remain being non-permanent structures. They won't, there will be no digging, dredging, trenching, um, no permanent uh, footings of any kind, um, but we will use, we will raise these um, and lengthen them. Um, so the new proposal for this bridge would be <coughs> to, um, on the north west side, increase by four, uh, six feet, or by four feet, I'm sorry, and on the southeast side, uh, six to eight feet. Is everybody, does that make sense? Um, okay, and then this is, so we'll move to bridge two, um, traveling eastbound on the trail, right here, just south of the pond. Um, and on this one, we are facing north. Um, the new proposal would be to rotate this clockwise um, roughly 10 to 15 degrees, um, taking the north side of the bridge a little further east away from that down tree um, and further into the center of that pathway and out of the bank. Um, we would propose a three foot extension on the northeast side and a five foot on the southwest side. And then on to bridge three. Um, we now get much closer to uh, College Street for frame of reference, kind of across the street from Subway. And on this one, 
we are facing north. <laughs> um, the new proposal uh, remains the same as from this uh, prior. It would be a two foot extension on both sides. Um, also raising this to be a little closer to grade with uh, the bog bridge on the north side and on the south side. And then the final bridge, bridge four, uh, crossing Fearing Brook near College Street. Uh, this one would have a six foot extension on the north side and a four foot extension on the south side. And that is essentially, let's see, all work would be done uh, by hand, uh, bringing in materials, bringing out old materials. Um, and once again, we would not be implementing any <coughs> uh, digging of any kind. So I will stop sharing my screen. And there we go. Excellent. So, thank you, Kenny. Kate, did you have anything to add before I turn it over to Aaron? Sure. Um, let me just add a tiny bit of context, which is that uh, all of these bridges had sustained some damage earlier in the fall and uh, were unsafe at, uh, for various reasons at different points. One of them we fear is going to fall into the brook. Um, one of them is tilted pretty heavily so that if it's slippery, we're worried about people falling off. Um, one of them had a tree on top of it, which was taken off and temporarily repaired. Um, and then the other one is down pretty low. And um, as Aaron pointed out this morning at the site visit, um, really could be obstructing uh, water flow underneath. So I think the hope is in all of this to try to make these more usable, but also in a way that's gonna help actually protect the resource in the long run by lifting them up out of the, out of the streams and, and out of the bank area. Um, so uh, Aaron gave us several great suggestions this morning on, on how to do that in terms of getting them up and out um, but I think we would love to also hear uh, other thoughts from the commission on how to do this in a way that's going to protect the resource. I don't think there's any question that this is in um, a very sensitive uh, area in terms of resource use. That's why the college um, likes to have students out there. Uh, they're able to do things like a bio blitz where they go out and identify different species. Um, there's experiments and research that, that's happening in this area and uh, so I think the request for determination was motivated by the thought that uh, we would be doing this in a way that, that doesn't affect the resource area. Um, not that it's not in a resource area because it clearly is. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Kate. So Aaron. Yeah, so um, this, is, this is kind of in a tricky one for me um, just because of my, my background permitting trail bridges. Um, I would ordinarily recommend notice of intent filings for these. Um, in this case, they are existing bridges. Um, I don't know how long they've been in for. I don't know if there was permitting for the original bridge. Um, but if somebody was to come forward proposing a new footbridge, I would always require a notice of intent. Um, it's just because you're a lot of times talking about bank impacts, wetlands impacts, et cetera. In this case, they're existing bridges, so that's a consideration. Also, adjusting these bridges will be a tremendous improvement to existing conditions on the site. And if you see the bridges and what's going on out there, you would see that it's really, they're, they're damaging the resources at this point, causing erosion underneath where they're situated. So those are kind of my first initial comments. Um, <clears throat> the initial submission did not include bridge plans. So um, I spoke with Kenny about that today. They came up with a sort of a standard design. Um, and also um, I've talked to Kenny about for each of the sites providing um, measurements of what the bridge dimensions would be, um, including, you know, bank full estimates to make sure that we're staying outside of um, bank full for the placement of the footings on either side. Um, also because 
each of these bridges had no footings. They were basically just these um, platforms that were set on the ground that they should have some kind of a structural foundation under each. And that doesn't necessarily mean digging them in or ground disturbance. What it means is it could be as simple as setting a block and having the bridge be up on top of a block of some sort. It could be a flat stone. It could be you know, a cinder block um, type um, just set in place on a stable surface um, to raise it up a little bit so that you get a better openness ratio underneath the bridge. Um, so the bridge, they're gonna be submitting bridge plans to us. Um, the other thing that's kind of shaky about it is the there's no delineation here. Um, you know, ordinarily for a project, we would wanna see where the wetlands are located, where the bank is located um, and that sort of thing. And that's not included here. And after speaking with the applicant, I can understand kind of why they took the approach they did. It is a sort of a precedent setting situation in terms of saying, okay, we're gonna allow you to do this work without um, doing a delineation. All that said, like I said, it's doing damage right now. This will be an improvement to existing conditions. So I'm not gonna <laughs> obstruct it moving forward for that reason. Um, what I will say is that a lot of the footings are in existing wetland. Um, that was pretty clear, but by making the spans of the bridges longer and putting in a foundation of some sort, it will greatly improve um, the openness so that light can penetrate underneath the bridge, air can penetrate underneath the bridge. You can get some greater water flow underneath the bridge without um, uh, causing additional um, erosion underneath it. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, the way that we sort of left things was that the, the bridges were gonna be, the designs were gonna be revised and sort of provided to us in writing and then um, at that point, um, I would feel much more comfortable with with what has been proposed here. Thank you. Um, one oh. other just quick thing is that there is an endangered fern that's located on this site. And I know Eversource is transplanting it for the structure replacement project that's happening. And I just mentioned to the applicant that they should be in touch with natural heritage because there may be other endangered species on this site that we're unaware of. And there may be time of year restrictions or other issues. Um, and they should also familiarize themselves with the species out there so they can identify them and not impact them. Okay. So thank you, Erin. And yeah, one comment. So Leroy and I were out there um, today as well. And so it was great to actually see it because actually some of that erosion that's going on, you just can't capture that in some of those pictures, particularly that first, I think it's site number one that's closest to the campus. That has some serious issues. And when that sucker goes down, it's not gonna be good. Um, so I agree with you, Aaron, that yeah, uh, overall it will be a big improvement. Um, when we did similar, work on some of our trails on CONCOM land, we did go through and do, did do delineation for that. And so that would be our preferred mode for that. So when they come in front of us, uh, if that could happen, um, you know, so if you can look into that as a possibility, it should be fairly straightforward. Uh, I know that you guys had some challenges um, on the initial go at that, but if there's something that's reasonable, um, if there's some mitigating factor, let us know, but that is definitely our, our standard operating procedure, uh, including for our own lands. So um, I'll open up to other commissioners and we'll go to the general public. So comments or questions and um, yeah, particularly for Hugh Leroy, if you had other observations, I'm sorry, Kate. Can I just ask you a quick follow-up question on what you just said? Um, can you just tell us a little bit more about what specifically needs to be delineated? Because uh, there's there's a lot of wetlands there. Oh yeah. And uh, I think part of what happened to us is that we quickly got overwhelmed by the cost of being offered to delineate all of the wetlands. No, no, no. So tell us what uh, what's in scope. Yeah, I mean, so Aaron, can you um, specify a little bit more? I have an idea in my head, Kate, but yeah, Aaron would be able to specify, you know, so many feet on each side sort of thing, so. Yeah, so it would just be looking at the, um, the footprint of, of the area where the work is being done. And 
I mean, I think really ultimately it's up to the commission to make a decision on whether for this specific project they would want to see that delineated or um, because this is these are existing bridges and you're trying to make improvements, if that's something that, you know, uh, we, the, the board was willing to um, kind of wave at this point. I can say that on at least three out of four of the bridges, if not four out of four, that the, the bridges are set directly in wetland that is um, adjacent to the intermittent streams. So they are already there in the wetland and they're getting carved out underneath. So picking the bridges up, improve, increasing the span is going to be a dramatic improvement to what's happening already. Um, but uh, I would say for future projects, we should definitely get you guys set up or, you know, suggest some folks that you guys can get on board that will be <clears throat> more financially uh, <laughs> in reach <laughs> to do the work for you, to do the delineating for you. Oh, yeah, not sure. Not sure. Okay. All right, go ahead, Jen. Thanks. Yeah, I was just going to say that I think since these are, there's like no question whether or not these are in the resource area. Um, and because they're a hazard currently, um, we should consider not, not doing a formal delineation here, but instead making sure that the new bridges are higher and wider than the existing bridges, because we know we're improving and chances of building the type of infrastructure that would take us truly out of the resource here is infeasible and probably unnecessary. Um, but I think that there is a fine line, you know, for projects with more significant infrastructure, like we do need to do these delineations. They're very important um, for both the existing projects and the future of the protection of the resource. So um, that's my two cents on that. And then just, just to add on to what Jen was saying there, it's just uh, in terms of infrastructure, do you guys see, have you ever, can you ever use those diamond piers before? You know what I'm talking I can, about? I, I do not know. They're actually pretty sweet. They come in all different sizes. There are, there are pieces of cement with four holes and you literally impact pipes into it and they cross in. I do you know what you're talking about? And actually uh, yeah. I had brought that up as a potential uh, footing today. Yeah, so. Exactly, yes. Those seem to be working pretty good for some people been doing on, on Hitchcock Center did them and whatever, the guys at Conservation Works use them all the time, but that's one option. Just at least to get, get the stuff. That's what Jen was saying and Aaron mm -hmm. was saying. Get it up and out. Yep. So whatever that the those sense. things are, they're sturdy. actually they only yeah they're super sturdy and they only go down a couple inches. Mm -hmm. The 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 pier itself, but the pipes go down. So anyway. The other trick, kind of trick of the trade, is sauna tubes. So usually you have to pour, you know, mix cement, and that can be hard to do at these sensitive sites. What you can do is get cement mix that usually you would add water to, put them in the ground as a footing, and they'll absorb water from the soil moisture over time too. So they're like tricks in order to low impact, do like a pretty significant footing up and out away from the stream that will better support the bridge in the long term. So one question I have for the commissioners about the delineation. So no matter what they do, it's going to be an improvement. So I fully agree with that. My big question is how far out, you know, they should, they should make these. And so I think that the delineation could potentially help with that. Yeah, but to what extent? Yeah, I just, I think the whole thing is so low and so wet, right? The whole place is wet. Yeah, they're going to, they're not, they're not going to be able to leave the adjacent wetland without entering another wetland. Not the wetland, but they'd at least be able to identify more concretely what is the top of bank would be more what I'd be looking for. Okay, and so you know, that's more along Aaron's comments of trying to get an estimate of bank full, which I think is yes, kind of, so maybe there's some um, synergy there where we could do some bank full calculations, wetted wet, I mean, that's they're very easy available online tools for making those estimates um, that are pretty reliable. So that might be another middle ground there. Like we could say maybe condition that we want them X feet. I mean, for mass stream crossing standards, it's 1.2 times bank full for the width 
of a bridge. And I don't know what the clearance regulations are, Aaron, maybe you know off the top of your head, but you know, we could say that that's a good starting point and they have to be wider than that, something like that. Exactly. And that's what we talked about in the, on the site visit today. And the question is just what is 1.0 um, is what I'm trying to get at. So right. what it, yep. Well, yep. So you can do that in stream stats um, pretty easily. Okay. And I actually have one more question. Um, are, is there work going to be done, mitigation work going to be done on Fearing Brook from the um, apartment building being built? Or, um, yeah, I remember the this. There? Is there something Houston. else going on in there? I'm sorry, guys, this is kind of not your. Yeah, your, I know what you're talking about, time. Fletcher. And the, remember the Southeast Street Commons, there was going to be an yeah, in-kind was... payment to replacing the um, spot on Fearing Brook where it goes yeah. underneath that main inner Southeast Amherst like center intersection. I don't yeah. know what the status of that is, but that right. project is that's significantly definitely. downstream of what we're talking about. It's downstream though. Yeah. I, I was wondering exactly where the location was. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. down like okay. near Florence Bank. Yeah, behind the okay. bank. Oh yeah, it's just that. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. All yeah. right, sorry. Yeah, and the the openness ratio, just to, to touch on that question really quickly, um, I mean, it can be calculated based on um, it, like the, the minimum op openness ratio is 1.64 feet, but um, th that's like a bare minimum, but I mean, you, requiring up to six feet from the, from the water level to the, to the decking, um, you know, on a flashy stream that is not <laughs> you know, I mean, particularly that, that one that we saw that was, that was the first, I think, site one, I think in that case, it's even more than six feet. I mean, you're talking a pretty significant height off of the water level. So it really, it really depends on the specifics of the, of the channel to make sure that it's done right. And there's a calculation that you can do. So it's an educational process, but the, the, the bank full process that Jen was talking about, it's is looking at a cross section and understanding sort of where that bank full mark is in terms of where water would overtop the channel if it um, flooded. And then taking that measurement and saying 1.2 times that so that you know that your footings are outside of that area. But there are, there's a, a mass stream crossings handbook that um, I could send you a link to that provides more information on that. So it's kind of like, you know, talking about it without having the document in front of you. But it's, it's, I can tell you this, it's very straightforward and I'd be happy to even do like a zoom and go through it with you just so you could kind of see that um, we're not shooting from the hip here that it's actually something that you can measure out in the field using sort of common sense tools. Yes. I. I, yes, I'm sorry if we got jargony on you guys, but the point of what we're trying to say is that this can be done without a formal delineation in a way that will achieve all of the goals we're discussing. And Aaron, I was just going to say, if there's something I can do to help provide resources for this, let me know. Absolutely. Great. So Dave, did you have a comment on this? I saw you leaning forward. <laughs> you kind of listened, Brett. <laughs> Um, I did just squeeze in dinner uh, there while I was gone, but I was listening the whole time. Um, no, um, I think this is all a great discussion. Um, I do see some parallels between the, the, the work that the commission just did to permit the trail improvements over at Kodak and Captain Cole, um, you know, kind of the limited scope and, and Aaron, correct me if I'm wrong, but kind of the limited scope of, of the delineation that was done there, uh, I think allowed the commission to move forward and um, provided information that DEP, I think we haven't really heard formally from DEP, but I think um, was more in line with what DEP was, was uh, hoping we would do. The other thing while, while um, Kenny and Kate are on the call, I, I, I think I'd be remiss. Whenever I see a map of the Fearing Brook, I. I feel compelled to mention that you know Amherst has and continues to invest a significant amount of money to and resources time to improve the water quality in the Fearing Brook, 
And if I'm not mistaken, I mean, most of these streams, do they, are they flowing into the fearing from there? Or are they flowing downstream into the fort? Um, certainly one of these bridges crosses the fearing brook, but um, we would very much like to have Amherst College um, an active partner with us to improve the water quality and um, uh, uh, other attributes of the, um, of the Fearing Brook. Um, I think I'm, I'm on fairly solid ground to say that Fearing Brook is probably um, the most compromised tributary of the Fort River in Amherst. It may be the most compromised tributary on the, on the entire Fort River watershed, but I'm not sure about that. And Amherst, we take some responsibility for that because it drains about a quarter to a half, an, a half of our downtown. But um, we are gonna do a very significant um, uh, floodplain restoration project downstream. But there's no question that st that section in the Amherst College Sanctuary um, could really use some, some, um, some design and improvements. Uh, it is um, a really you know, uh, compromised stretch there and, and, and uh, I'm sure you guys are aware of it. So anyway, in the future, 2021, 20, 22, 23, we'd love to work with you guys on, on that uh, stream quality there and, and water quality. There's that, inc that, incredible, that incredible uh, perched uh, culvert that comes out of the, the parking lot there below the power plant. Um, it's it's kind of like Niagara Falls that enters the Fearing Brook and it uh, on certain days, that's a great little kayak run there, but it really shouldn't be, and, and we can improve that. Thanks. We we would absolutely uh, have no problem partnering on that. My my understanding is that the uh, college in the past has done just that. Um, I know uh, Jim Brassard has em implored my predecessor, uh, Bob Shea, to um, provide resources in the past in terms of manpower and would be more than willing to in the future. That's great, thanks. We'll, we certainly will be talking. Thanks, Dave. I wanted to add also that, yeah, that would be wonderful. And I think part of the purpose of all of this is to get the sanctuary back on the map, so to speak. Um, I think that the college sometimes forgets that that land is there. And uh, the more that we get people out on it and aware of it, I think the, the more attention will be paid to its preservation in the long run. Mm -hmm. but one more quick comment, Brad, along those lines, Kate. You know, um, I'm a birder also and, and spend a lot of time on our trails, but, you know, one thing you could do is on the western end of the sanctuary near the um, Amherst Farmer Supply, um, it is a very um, <laughs> underwhelming entrance, shall we say. Um, but, you know, putting up some sort of a sign there, uh, the fence is falling in, there's a gate there. Um, it's really not, you know, I know there are multiple entrances to the sanctuary, but that's one that the public uses quite frequently. And I think a lot of alums use that because they remember it in a different way than it currently is. But it's, um, it's not well marked and it just doesn't say, welcome to the Amherst College Sanctuary. So just an idea. Signage and marking is all absolutely a, a, a piece of the greater project that we're looking at here. Um, so those are all definitely things we're looking at. Okay, and then also moving forward, Aaron, they're going to require DEP and heritage letters. Oh, Aaron, we can't hear you. You did. DEP issued comments on the RDA for this one, oh, okay. um, and wow. and they. They responded to those comments and I did send those to Mark Stinson. He, he definitely had his eye on this and he was, he inquired with me whether I wanted him to come to the meeting tonight. And I was like, um, I think we should just, you know, let's let things see where things go um, before we, before that is necessary. Um, but he definitely had some issues. So, but I think the revisions are going to be a tremendous improvement to that um, from a DEP standpoint. From the natural heritage standpoint, I'm not sure if they actually need to, um, because it's not estimated habitat, I'm not sure that they actually need to file with natural heritage. I was more suggesting that they reach out to natural heritage and just have a conversation. Okay, good. And so I must have missed the, um, the DEP letter, so my apologies for that. Um, was, what was their take on delineation? They asked for one. 
Okay. They did. They did mention that because they, they, you know, they don't like people using the, um, the the DEP wetland layer and hydrology layer in applications because they're they're really inaccurate. You can show wetlands where there's no wetlands, no wetlands where there are wetlands. Uh, wetlands change so dramatically that they they just they discourage that they like to see sort of on the ground delineation okay. um so yeah okay good that's helpful. that was one of the comments okay okay so um anything from the other commissioners before i'll open it up to the public and then i'll bring it back in and we can do um sort of final round of what we think is needed so nothing from the commissioner. So anybody from the general public, if you just want to use the little icon, raise your hand. Okay, um, so not seeing any at this point. Um, and so obviously we're going to need to continue. So there's, you know, a couple of additional pieces. Um, you know, so it sounds like obviously there's going to be some redesign work. So we'd love to see that. Uh, or we'd like to see that. Um, there's a request for a delineation. So if that is feasible, that is something that, um, you know, would be, would help. Um, so what are the other pieces that commissioners would like to see or correct what I said? So we're just saying, or we're just saying uh, bridge design. We want to see bridge design. We talked about, well, not the delineation, but show the extent um, and just bridge design showing the dimensions that will pass a bank fall event for the bank. So just to clarify, the there is a request for the the bank fold, like the, the delineation of the banks for sure that we got. And then where did we end up on broader delineation? Yeah, I don't see any need for any sort of broader delineation. Yeah, it's all wetland down there, but I mean, so yeah, as long as we have some delineation, yeah, I think that'd be yeah, very helpful. Yeah, just within the scope of work as well. Yeah, and what Brett means is just like show us on the plans where the bank full, like top of bank and bank full, which I'm guessing is pretty close to each other in these creeks and show us where we are relative to that, just so we can make an easy evaluation of where the bridges are located relative to the stream and likely stream flood elevations. That makes perfect sense. So you can basically just see that we follow the map up, map map on the bridge lengths appropriately. Exactly. Yep. yep. Okay. That makes perfect sense. Yep. Anything else, Aaron, that we're missing? I just I just sent you a, an email, Kenny, with the um, link to the stream crossing handbook. And um a, you know, just for for your reference, a couple consultants for the future. Um, but yeah, I I just want to agree with what the board is saying. I think my primary concern is keeping the bridge abutments outside of the bank um, so that it's not going to be eroding and causing future damage. And I agree there's BVW on either side of those streams. So it's, it's, um, it's going to be an improvement over the existing conditions. Okay, um, and so all of this work, Kenny and Kate, um, is two weeks enough time? Do you guys need more than that? I think that seems reasonable. Okay, so are we looking at 735 then, Aaron? That's what I would recommend. Okay, so looking for a motion, I think that was the 27th, correct? Correct. Uh, looking, uh, I'll uh, make a motion to, con to continue at I'm sorry, January 27th at 7.25 p.m. 7.25. Yes. Second. Okay, so, oh, so Anna, you recuse Dang. or abstain. Yep, uh, Jen? Aye. Fletcher? Aye. Larry? Aye. <laughs> Laura? Aye. Leroy? Aye. And I, from me as well. So thank you, Kenny. Thank you, Kate. Um, yeah, really great stuff. It's going to be a huge improvement. And yeah, we look to even more fruitful collaborations um, between the college and town as we move forward. So thank you thank very you much. Guys. And we appreciate your time. Yeah, thanks for your patience and helping to uh, educate us a little bit too. Thanks. <laughs>
Have a good day. Okay, so dee, 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 dee. Um, just switching up a couple of things. Okay, so I think we are good. Okay, um, so those are the only two items that we had um, as official hearing. So Aaron, is there a certain direction that you wanna go? Is there something that other, maybe that the attendees are potentially here for that we might want to address sooner so that people can, obviously people can stay as long as you want. But yeah. Um, so I, I just, I'd like to just handle the one remaining request for certificate of compliance because it's, I believe just an in really administrative and I think it'll go really quickly. Um, and then move to the um, enforcement items. Okay. Because there's a couple people here from the enforcement side and I don't want to take their time, but I also want to get the, um, you know, minor quick thing out of the way so that we can dig into the enforcement. Sounds good. Um, so we received a request for certificate of compliance. Um, this is basically at our last meeting, there was a, request for certificate of compliance or three of them for lot seven on the Applebrook subdivision um, off of West Street. And um, that was for lot seven, but we received the same series of requests for the three certificates of compliance um, for lot eight. And lot eight is actually located outside of any CONCOM jurisdictional areas. So, um, hmm. And I went out to the site, it's fully stable, the house is constructed, and I would just recommend that we um, issue a certificate of compliance for the three um, outstanding DEP file numbers. Sounds good, yep, sounds straightforward. So looking for a motion for um, certificates of compliance. And these are the three numbers right here, I'll highlight them. Yeah, so I move to. Um, you go. I move to. Uh, we'll do it um, to accept the uh, certificates and compliance for Applebrook subdivision DEP num file number zero eight nine zero five seven four zero eight nine five zero five two seven and zero eight nine zero six two six. Just on lot eight, though. Just on lot eight. Second. Second that. Okay, so thank you. Um, so voice votes, I'll do the opposite order. So Leroy? Aye. Anna? Aye. Uh, Larry? Aye. Fletcher? Aye. Laura? Aye. Jen? Aye. And I as well. Okay, so that is done. Which enforcement would you like to go into, Aaron? Um, I'd like to start with Carver Ave. Um, do a little update on that because I see there's several um, abutters here for that. Is it Canton Ave? Did I say, what did I Carver. say? Carver. Yeah. Carver. Canton, right? right? I was like, where's Carver? I don't know why. It's, it's Road. <laughs> like the Eastern Mass names. I keep switching them. So my apologies. Okay. So, but it's Canton that we're talking about. Canton. Okay. Is it Canton or Carver? I can never remember. I'll Canton. Canton Avenue. Not, there's no Carver. It's Eastern Mass. That's Cranberry <laughs> Land. Yeah, we do have a Harvard, but that's different. No. Um, different. That's near there, though. So oh, I'll I'll Harvard? just kind. Of, Harvard. <laughs> yeah. I'll just kind of give a brief a brief overview. Um, Over to Ave. Sort of what has transpired since um, the last. Cause we, cause I don't know if the board recalls, but we issued an enforcement. We also issued a continuation to the end of February. And um, I don't want to wait on this one. Um, I want to just keep the board regularly updated and kind of have, have the board ready to make a decision of how you want to proceed and, and keep you up to date. Cause some stuff has happened. Um, so at the last, at the last, you know, we had requested that they get a surveyor out there to replace the flags on the lot where work had been done um, in violation of the order of conditions. Um, I had reached out prior to the last meeting to the landowner, or to the um, Wilson Construction, who's the landowner, and said, what's the status of this? Could you give us a, an update before the last meeting, which I never heard from them. 
And then about a week later, we got a request for a forest cutting plan on the entire site. Um, I reached out to the service forester for our, re for our town and basically explained, we have an existing enforcement order out here and we will not allow any work to move forward with any forest cutting until this enforcement issue is resolved. So the forest cutting plan got denied. Mm -hmm. And I eventually made contact with Pete and I said, what is the status? Because we're waiting to do a site visit and we want to see where the wetland was and what's going on. And he said his surveyor couldn't get out there until April and the order of conditions expires at the end of February. And so for me personally, um, like what I did as a result of this was I contacted Bucky Sparkle who did the original plan and worked with the original surveyor and original wetland people out there. And I said, Bucky, could, could we, what would it cost to have the flags replaced out there? And so he got back to me with a quote of what that would be. And I think it was like in the range of 600 to like $1,100 to have the flags replaced. And it sounded like, yeah, they could just get out there and do it relatively quickly. Um, and um, I just don't want this to be like a tactic that's used to stall our progress or to sort of um, cause the commission to feel like they need to give additional extensions when it would have been very simple for them to make a quick phone call to Bucky to have this taken care of and so that we could just move forward. I don't know who their surveyor is. I asked who was their surveyor and I asked them for a correspondence saying that, you know, they were booked out until April. But um, in the meantime, I was contacted by several um, abutters who caught wind of the forest cutting plan and had witnessed the cutting that had happened. And um, I did put in the one drive um, some PDFs of emails that they had sent to us. But I see Gaston is on the call and Ben Bailey's on the call. There may be other people on the call um, as well who are, who are neighbors to that project. So that's where things stand right now. And I asked them to attend so that they could just kind of give you a quick snapshot of what they saw there. Aaron, did you say those emails were in the, I'm, I'm just, I just didn't see them in the folder. Yeah. Where I, didn't, I didn't see them either. Um, I'll double check. So I saw the emails, but I was just a part of those threads outside of that, so. Ooh, I see them, I think, in, in enforcements under. Um, yeah. yeah. I see email, email, email from, from Pete Wilson. Wilson. That's not it. it. There's there's, you know there's 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 some documents there. Thursday, there January seventh. Pete Wilson. Yeah. So forth and so on. Okay. Yeah, I'll I will make sure I'll I'll just Thanks, double check and grab them right now so that you guys have yeah, them. Pete Wilson isn't the abutter. Pete Wilson is the. No. Yeah. Thanks, Aaron. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. I'm not sure the attachments are there. I just I just pulled them in so you can grab them and see. There's some pictures there oh, as well. Yeah. And, and you know, one of the things I'll just note quickly, um, and uh, Ben and Gaston, if you want to talk, feel free to raise your hand. But, um, you know, when we, <laughs> in the meeting, we were told no work had taken place in the wetlands. Um, I don't think that that was accurate. And if you, <laughs> it, they, they said they were just out there with chainsaws cutting trees. There was an excavator parked in the area where the wetland was, which I, you know, is in those documents. So um, anyways, I see Ben raising his hand. I'll, yeah. I'll go ahead and uh, make him. Well, work. actually, before we get there, um, I just yeah. want to see if the applicant is here or anybody representing the applicant. No, I mean, I, um, so, Aaron, I didn't you're even. You, you haven't heard anything from them. So you, I, you clearly just said you, you reached out to them a number of times. You haven't heard anything. No, I've, I've had communication with them. Um, they said they, April. the last communication was that they had reached out to their, their surveyor That's it. and that they um, couldn't get out there until April. And I said, I would recommend seeking out alternate, alternate people to do the work. And I said, I, I will personally recommend, uh, I will not recommend an additional extension. And that what I said was, I would rather the commission 
independently have somebody go out and place the flags almost as a peer review type process to replace the flags in by a third party independent person. Because quite frankly, um, I'm not sure that we're getting accurate information and I'm not sure placement of the flags would be accurate if they didn't contact the original surveyor who placed the points and they didn't do that. I know that because I reached out to them, so. Did the cutting plan show any of those wetlands that were in conversation? No, but um, just for context, the cutting plan was developed by a forester, but the cutting was to be done by Wilson Construction, not by an outside company. And to me, it just was a very sketchy, very sketchy um, hmm. situation. Now that was, does happen in the town of Carver. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> So um, I'm going to open up to the public. So Benjamin, you should be able to speak at this point. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So um, when Wilson Construction started clearing this lot back in December, November, December 2019, my wife and I went out and confronted them. They had heavy machinery coming in and they were chainsawing everything in a big rectangle coming in from Canton Ave. Um, I asked them if they had the plans with them. They had no plan with them. They had no map with them. There were no flags for the wetlands at that, at that point. When we asked them, we told them that they were on wetlands, they said, no, the wetlands were up there and just pointed in a general direction to the north. I knew the lot, you know, I knew from the plans that Bucky Sparkle had done, there was a curious driveway that went down and followed the south border of the property very carefully because that was to avoid wetlands. So I knew if they were coming in with machinery, they had to be taking this little tight, you know, catwalk along that property. They did nothing of the sort. They just came in through their, with their machines through the whole thing. Uh, let me read a, a, a couple of lines from an email I sent to our neighbors, other abutters in December 11th, 2019. So this was shortly after. Uh, on a more general note, Wilson Properties started clearing part of one of the lots. When we approached them, they had no maps or measurements with them about where they could clear. They just seemed to be cutting down trees in a way that would be convenient for, the, for them. The huge corridor that they cleared in from Canton Ave has little resemblance to the careful designs with limited impact that were presented to the Conservation Committee and the ZBA. Um, so that's the text of an email that I've got a copy of sent out right at this time when, uh, when this happened. Um, they could not even identify where the corner pins were for the property and basically didn't seem interested in, in finding out where they were, where the property lines were or anything. Okay. Thank you, Benjamin. Um, anything else, Benjamin, or any questions for Benjamin? Then we'll go next to Gaston. Okay, so Gaston, uh, you should be able to speak at this point. Okay, you can hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. So uh, I'm the buyer of the, the Fabos house. And as you know, it was uh, the Fabos with the leadership of their son, Adrian Fabos, who prepared the subdivision plan. And we acquired the Fabos house with that plan and you know had no input um, on a, any part of that. Um, you know, so we obviously are, have a lot of interest in how the, the land is developed. It's right across from us and right next to our house. Um, uh, we've, uh, I've approached the, the Wilsons and they've been pleasant um, to talk to. Um, however, when I went to ask about their cutting, they did not tell me that they needed any plans or that there was any uh, guidance or restriction. And, and certainly um, they had heavy equipment on the day um, when they uh, had the hearing December of 2019. That morning, I, I snapped a picture because there was a large digger parked close to the street. My request was, can you at least please park this further from the street so it's less of an eyesore? Um, uh, I will say that it's, um, I was at that hearing upset with the other abutters because part of the request for the extension involved uh, a request for a waiver of the condition that they notify abutters and, and place a newspaper ad when they um, submitted or revised their plans. Um, and so neighbors spoke out against this. I invited Pete Wilson to withdraw 
his request for that waiver and he did. Uh, when we conferred afterwards, he said that that had been uh, suggested by uh, the person taking his application in the town as a way to avoid uh, spending money on the newspaper ad, which, you know, I don't know if that's, I don't know if that's true. Um, I mean, I will say that I don't, I don't like to see a forest flattened for housing development in a way that breaches uh, the conditions and laws that govern activity for the sake of protecting um, this ecosystem. Um, and uh, that may have already happened apparently in, at, at the lot across the street, the one acre lot. Uh, certainly, I don't wanna see that happen in, in the larger <laughs> four acre lot, which um, as you know, is contiguous with an 18 acre lot owned by Mary Anderson. And um, these uh, you know, 20 plus acres um, really represent the kind of largest and last space of, of nature in, the, in central Amherst. And so I just think it's important to make sure that any, any work is done well. And um, I'm happy to answer any questions I can. Um, these would be my, my general remarks. Thank you, Gaston. So any questions for, or comments for Gaston at this point, or? I wanna say that, that the permit he was referencing there was a zoning approval, I believe. For the, um, waiver of the condition to notify abutters. That request, I think, came through the zoning board. OK, and so um, Jamie, um, you should be able to speak at this time. You, OK, yep. You're uh, good to thank you. Yeah, we're the residents of 179 North Whitney uh, abutting the property. Uh, and yeah, I mean, I guess from, you know, to, to, I'm, I'm not sure how many of you were, were around in 2017, 2018 when this was approved, uh, but, but those of you that were will recall um, um, very, very significant, significant details. details. From, uh, can you guys hear me all right? Yeah, we can. There was some feedback there for a second, but before that, we were good. Um, so you may recall that Bucky Sparkle uh, brought very, very significant plans where he literally mapped every single tree and you you went tree by tree of approving which trees could be removed and which ones couldn't um so I, I i'm not sure that there's good faith here on behalf of mr wilson when he sent in people to clear cut the land that you very distinctly did not give him approval to do there were only certain trees that were allowed to be removed in those original plans for the lot one and we're obviously rather terrified that uh, you know, the, the majority of the wet, wetland abuts directly at the back of my property and, and, and Mary's property. And I've been in touch with Mary. She's in California and wasn't able to join tonight. But, um, you know, she's obviously significantly worried as well um, that, that there's going to be clear cutting of, you know, the majority of the forest behind us. And obviously the, the, the integral part of the trees to the wetland uh, is, is something that needs to be taken into consideration, particularly as you took many months to, to, to go to the extent of looking uh, literally tree by tree of, of what you would approve and what you wouldn't. And, and I think that he's really completely ignored you and, uh, and, and needs to fa face the consequences of that. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Jamie. Um, so I'm gonna go to Mary next, cause, and then I'll go back to you, Gaston. So- Hi. Um, yep. Yeah, thank you for calling on me. Yeah, so Jamie, thank you. And um, I wanted to report about one incident I had with Wilson this past April. I was notified by Freddie Munger that someone had flagged, had put little tags, and they did not appear to be on the actual property line. So I hired somebody to go out there and use the city's plans and compare the city plans or the town plans to the, the little markers that were there. And they were for sure off obviously in favor of Wilson onto my property, substantially like 10 yards, 15 yards onto my property. I contacted Mr. Wilson, who seemed to be quite surprised by the whole thing. And he said he would look into it and get back to me. And I've not heard anything from him since. And um, I think it's just another example of people who like to, who would prefer to apologize than do things right in the first place. And he's hoping if he apologizes, oops, oops, didn't mean to, where everybody's gonna say it's okay. I think that we've played this game long enough. They've already, they have already done substantial damage, substantial damage to that property. Um, 
And the people who live lower, it actually doesn't even bother me very much, but the people who live lower, the people behind um, down off of Canton Avenue have already a water problem due to earlier work Fabus did when he owned the land years ago. And now there's going to be more damage. So in the letter that uh, Mr. Wilson mailed, which I finally received two days ago, dated December 19th, um, he said something about a 200 foot back perimeter. My request is that they be required. I like the third party surveyor suggestion. I think that is totally appropriate in this case. Um, my request is that they be re required to flag with a line, not with a little ribbon on some twig that a deer steps on and knocks down, but to actually flag and delineate clearly the 200 feet from the property line of all the abutters. They don't have to do the railroad tracks, but they need to do all the rest of us. And they need to line that out so that anybody could look at it and could walk in there and see where the cut zone is allowed to be. Not with, flat, not with ribbons, but with an actual string all the way around on three sides. That's the first request. The second request is that given the damage they've done and given the problems that occur every year in the, in the spring and again in the fall when rains and so on occur, that mother nature be given a year to recover from what they have done and they not be allowed to do anything in there for a year. And let's see what mother nature does now that they filled in part of her wetlands. There was a stream when Fabus owned that property from what I can tell in the pictures that Gaston sent me, I think the area they filled in is where that little stream was that Bob has had to build a bridge over his little trail because that stream ran all the time. Who knows where that water is going to go now? So I think Mother Nature needs a year to recover. And I think they need to be required to come back with real honest to God plans. And if that, if this commission approves those plans, you need to send somebody out there on a weekly basis to supervise and survey because time after time, they, Wilson has demonstrated he's not reliable. I, I emailed him the other day. I called the other day. Of course, he has no phone number on his literature. So you have to look him up on the white pages. But I did find a phone number for him. Of course, he didn't return my phone call. I just don't think that they are, shall we say, responsible neighbors. And I think that we need to attend very carefully to anything that they do in there. And that doesn't even talk about the fact that it shouldn't be, have been allowed in the first place. Thank you for listening. Okay, thank you, Mary. And I just want to make it clear that there are certain things that um, about this that are within our purview and certain things that are not. And so when we're talking about the pieces that are directly related to the wetlands, 100%, the, those are things that we need to deal with. There's going to be other pieces that um, would have to be dealt with by another board. Oh, Okay. But, I, I but just, that. but just to just to make sure that we're addressing this, Mary, um, that forest cutting plan got denied. It is not. They they should not be cutting anything. They they're, mm -hmm. they, they have a cease and desist, and there's no approved forest cutting plan out there until their enforcement issues resolved. So, and um, point taken as far as site monitoring. You know that they should be paying for a third party to monitor any work going on out there in the future because. Um, I agree okay. on that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank yeah. You. That's one of the reasons that we have orders of conditions. And then when they violate them, then yeah, there need to be round conditions. So thank you. So Gaston, did you have another comment you'd like to make? Uh, sure. Sure. Thank you. So, I mean, I guess the, my general comment is that um, given the, the pattern of conduct, we don't have confidence that the, the Wilson's development philosophy is, is consistent with uh, and designed to adhere to the development and conservation principles. Um, of, of Amherst and the, and the Commonwealth. That's the, the, the first point. Um, the second point is that um, they invested, I think, if I'm not mistaken, $210,000 for these two lots. And so they're business people, they're looking to make a return. And so I have concern that the incentive for the incentive to, to breach is, is quite high. And uh, so I, I, I just uh, request that the, the commission um, take that into, into consideration. And then my third and final point is uh, my concern for what remediation is, is appropriate uh, mm -hmm. with respect to the, the cutting and, and filling that has been done. Yeah, thank you. And yeah, there definitely needs to be, yeah, some work done because of that. So there's no doubt about that. So thank you. Okay, so uh, Julia. 
Hi, I just, uh, Julia Rushmeyer, and I am an abutter as well. And I just have a quick follow up question in terms of, yeah, one, the damage that's already been done and the trees mm -hmm. that have already been cut down. I don't know if it's a remediation plan that they have to put forth or whether there's some kind of penalty or some kind of financial penalty that, you know, what, what is the, <laughs> what do you do when, when that happens? That's my first question. And then the second question is, um, I guess I'm kind of, it sounds a little bit like it would make sense to deny their request for an extension because they've had lots of time to be able to do this. Um, and if that request for an extension is denied, do they have to then come up with a whole new plan regarding the wetlands or are they still held to the original plan that you all sort of reviewed and we all you know, worked on together in 2017? Yeah, okay, so um, the first piece is um, what happens to the land that they have already altered? That is a discussion that we as a commission need to come to conclusion on. Um, you know, at a minimum, it would need to be restored um, to, you know, something that is resembling the, the pre-disturbed condition. And granted, those were mature trees, so it can't come back exactly to that by any means. Um, you know, if there are additional ramifications, are there fines? Are there other issues? Is there something that is a possibility, but that would be something that we would need to discuss. If the order of conditions, if the extension um, is denied, then they would have to reapply. And at that point, it is basically starting anew. Um, they can definitely bring the plan before us that they submitted before, and it would be open, but it would be a complete new set of hearings. They would have to um, contact all of the abutters again, and we'd be basically starting from square one again. Thank you. Thank you. Jamie? Uh, very briefly, Brett, just uh, wanted a clarification on uh, the, the, what, what's under your remit and what's not. Um, it seems like the for forest cutting piece, he went for approval from somebody else, not from you. Is that correct? And if that is correct, is there any coordination between that body and, and your body because you were the ones that approved very specific trees that could be cut and which couldn't? So I guess and as an addendum to the request that Mary made, I'd like them to very clearly mark the trees that you allowed to be cut. If you're going to allow them to move on, which is a big if, I imagine, but if you did do that, I would want to be sure you know, the reason that the rest of us abutters all, all stood down in the end was because we were thought that you acted very reasonably in being very, very detailed on what could and couldn't, you know, you, you know we, we obviously didn't want property back there, but you did it in the, the way that would maintain the wetland and the wildlife. And, and, and you know, we're all, a, you know, more than a little bit shocked. It should also be noted that these, these people came and, and cut at the weekend. They didn't come during the week. Um, it was quite extraordinary. It was sort of as if they were doing it under, you know, uh, trying to not get caught. Yeah. Um, so Jamie, the question that you were bringing up regarding cutting plans. And so cutting plans, as long as they are removing above a certain amount of wood, they have to be approved by the Department of Conservation and Recreation, DCR in Massachusetts. If the cutting is within the town and if the cutting is on wetlands or adjacent to wetlands, then they will contact us regarding that. And so there is some coordination, but if it is just uplands, no, we don't have any purview related to that. Um, and so but, Fletcher, do you have anything you wanna add on the cutting plans piece here, obviously? Right, um, no, you pretty much nailed it. But I think, um, but Aaron already said it, that we already have an enforcement order and, and conditions on this property. So that's therefore the, um, the cutting plan was denied because of that. So there is no cutting plan. Um, we are the jurisdiction on the, for, the, for the wetlands on this property. And so we're, here we are uh, with an enforcement order. Okay, so Benjamin. Um, kind of, uh, I, I talked with Aaron about a meeting you had where the Wilsons came around November and it sounded like they acted in pretty bad faith. They denied that they had done anything wrong at that meeting. Uh, they brought in a septic tank person who said he had looked at the property and that they had followed the plan. Uh, to me, that shows really bad faith. 
And I would encourage the committee not to extend, uh, extend the permit, make them start from the beginning. Okay. Thank you, Benjamin. Yep. Can I just make one request before people stop start jumping off this call? Anybody who hasn't already been in touch with me as far as being in a butter on this site, could you just coordinate somehow and send me your email addresses? Because for future um, uh, discussions on this, I think it would be worthwhile for you guys to be included on the discussions. And so I'd just like to copy you on emails if, if we're going to be having um, you know, meeting discussions where this property is uh, discussed. Okay, so thank you, Aaron. That'd be great. Okay, so is there anybody else from the public um, who'd like to weigh in at this point? Okay, so um, back to us, um, to the commissioners on this one. And yeah, there's definitely some yeah, some weird and bad stuff that's happened on this one. Um, they've been given of, you know, I think a very fair chance on this one. I mean, initially when they were coming before us and we needed to do a short-term extension, um, I thought we were pretty generous with that. Um, yeah, so I'm not really, I'm not feeling very compelled by their argument that they can't find someone, especially given what you were saying, Aaron. Um, yeah, I don't quite know why that is, if they only have certain people they want to work with, if it's some tactic, I cannot you know, say one way or the other what's going on there. Um, we have our deadline at this point. Um, and particularly, it seems, did they mention, Aaron, why they weren't showing up tonight? I mean, that feels very weird to me. Um, the lack of yeah. communication is very- So, so, so this, was, this wasn't, I wasn't anticipating this tonight, all these abutters showing up. Um, and so this was merely meant to just give you guys an update <laughs> on my communication with them so that you guys were in the loop. But as it turned out, like a, a day or two ago, I was contacted and I told them, if you want to listen in on the meeting, you can, but they obviously know one another. And so everybody showed up. Um, so that was, I merely was just going to give you guys sort of a status update like I did at the beginning of the meeting. I didn't anticipate this at all. So I didn't like extend an invite for them to be involved because I didn't know that this was going to happen. Okay. Yeah. And I mean, as the butters know, as well as anyone, uh, I think it was just you, Fletcher, you and I who were on the commission at that point. But yeah, this was a pretty big deal when it happened. And at least my recollection was I get the two lots confused, but the bigger lot was the one that I recollect actually concentrating more on. And the first time I went out there, I was confused. Um, and so, but yeah, we definitely dealt, dealt with both of them. And I thought actually the other one was more complex. Um, they're, they're not easy. I mean, just to build in there, all the re replication we, that they have to do, the rain gardens, I mean, the crossing. Yeah. Uh, we did, we individually treat individual trees, it was, so, sorry. I wouldn't want to build it. I'm playing a little bit of catch up. When does the enforcement order, or when does the extension, sorry, expire right now? The end of February. End of February, okay. And what are the reasons to further extend that aside from the fact that they can't find a surveyor? Are there any other reasons? Well, the, uh, I think yeah, I, I'm agreeing with you guys. This, yeah, this so they, they had requested the extension first and that's when the, infor the, in the violation was discovered. Okay. So, and then they claimed that it wasn't a violation. They said, okay. no, no, uh, we didn't do anything um, to damage any wetlands. And so they were going to, but there was wetland flags missing out there. Obviously it looks like an, a wetland's been filled in. Um, yeah. So, um, Long story short, we issued a very short term extension to give them the benefit of the doubt so that they could go out there and reflag and demonstrate that they had done nothing wrong, but now they're not proceeding with that flagging um, in a timely way. And the permit's gonna expire before they get the, the wetland flags rehung. As I recall, we, that extension was longer than some of us felt was necessary. Right. We were generous, Larry, I think, yes. We were generous. Yeah, I, I, I think we should, anyway, I think that was our mistake. We shouldn't have extended it that long. No, I mean, I, I'm okay with giving, we need some sort of, it needs to be some sort of time, a reasonable time. 
I don't quite know what that is. Nobody does, but they still have plenty of time. Uh I mean, so, you know, end of February, you know, so if they really want to get their butts in gear, they can still do it. Granted, they're going to have to come back before us and we're going to need to approve those points as well. So it's not just, they're going to come back and we're like, okay, we're all good to go. That's just going to, you know, continue the conversation. Yeah. And the enforcement at this point is not going away. Um, They're going to have to deal with the enforcement. If their permit expires, their permit expires, but they're going to have to restore the area that's been damaged regardless. Um, From my perspective, I guess it's like, what, what's the next step? I mean, I could reach out to Pete and say, Hey, I got this quote from the original surveyor. This is what they've asked to do it. They can do it right now. What's the holdup? You know, um, you guys can do it and get it done or, we can just leave the ball in their court to the clock is ticking. You know, it's really, um, I don't want to, I didn't want to do too much due diligence on their behalf. It was more like for me to know, has, has, has Bucky been contacted? Is there anything we can do? Because if, if they don't respond to this enforcement, what's our next step? I mean, it's going to end up being fining or something. And if we can avoid that, I would rather work with them to get it done than to start finding them by the day. But if it comes down to that, then it may. It seems, when, when, I mean, when, we have, when we have time, to, when we get to the point of re- attempting to renew, can we tell them now that we expect to see some of the remediation they're supposed to do by that time to show their good faith? Absolutely. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to bring it up tonight was to give you guys some lead time. If you want to say, hey, If you guys want an extension, you have to do X, Y, and Z by this date. Otherwise, you're not going to get your extension. And I mean, there's a lot of new information that's been presented tonight. So um, maybe you guys want to think about it and talk about it at the next meeting um, to kind of come up with something. Or maybe you're ready tonight. I don't know. I just... um, I would like to see us say that they should show some good faith that they're going to restore the things they were asked to restore. They should begin that process. Well, Aaron, it it seems like you've gone above and beyond already in in so many ways that I'm I'm having a really hard time finding the the, uh, drive to continue to literally give them the answers when they're not taking any of them. Uh, Yeah. I mean, the biggest thing for me is and why this is sort of um, has made me feel better to talk to the abutters is because at that meeting, I was basically told I didn't know what I was talking about and that, you know, no wetlands were filled in. You know, I've been out to the site. No, wet- I've been doing this for 35 years. No wetlands were filled in. And it's like, if you just look at the plan and stand on the site, you can kind of see <laughs> where the wetland was supposed to be and it's not there anymore and there's no flags. So it kind of just... I needed to redeem myself and feel like I was doing that. I hadn't, you know, that this wasn't just me making a bad judgment call. Like Gosh. other people saw it too, you know? Yeah. And I guess on that note to the abutters who are still on the call, like, thank you for, for advocating. I, I guess like, even though it was not necessarily, even though it may have been somewhat of a surprise, it's, it was really good. That was really helpful. Um, thank you. Um, yeah. Brett, could I just weigh in for a sec? Please. So I've been listening to everything and I was around the table when, when, when the project, uh, when the lots were permitted uh, a couple of years ago. So um, number one, I think Aaron has, has done a tremendous job gone above and beyond. And from a, from a staff resource standpoint, um, I, I'm not really in favor of spending any more town time um, helping this developer. Um, and happy to go on record with that. Um, I think the commission, it would be very helpful if the commission gave Aaron some direction um, tonight on how to how to proceed or how to communicate, I think, with Mr. Wilson. Um, I think you've given him the benefit of the doubt multiple times and there is adequate evidence here that um, uh, he is not proceeding in good faith. So um, I I think you've been more than generous with extended deadlines and and, um, the conversations you've had with him as has Aaron. And and I think we just need to 
be as clear as possible with our communication with him and then take the necessary steps. Um, whether it's not granting that extension, obviously keeping the, um, the, um, um, uh, the, no, the cease and desist no work order in place and making it clear that there, there will be replication. I think Aaron's very early point was that with the flags gone on the ground, you don't, you know, you can, you can bring the plan, but you really don't know where the wetlands were and the streams were because the site is such a mess. So um, I think, I feel like we've reached the point of uh, enough is enough. Um, and it's really in Mr. Wilson's uh, court to do something or not. Um, but I don't think we should bend any, you should bend any long uh, further. And, and um, I don't want to spend any more staff time on this project if uh, um, from the town standpoint. Thanks. Yeah, I agree with what everybody's been saying. And yeah, Aaron, I think that you've done a phenomenal job and have gone above and beyond. And so, yeah, nobody ever doubted your, <laughs> your take. Um, but yeah, you have been vindicated many times over. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, one of the actions I think we can take is basically sort of a no action, meaning that right. we have the plan set out at this point. And so he needs to get surveys done by that date. If that doesn't happen by that date, it, there is no continuation, period. Um, once the, so that's one scenario. Other scenario is that they actually do get the surveys done by then. If that happens, then that needs to come before us. And then we need to figure out next steps then. Um, and so that's obviously not the end all be all, but I mean, that's just the beginning. But without that, we can't even start. We don't know the total area that's been impacted. Obviously stuff has been impacted, but we need that to start with before we can really move forward. And that's been spelled out for him already. So I think Brett, that's it. We just wait until the next the meeting comes and we already, we already told them what we're looking for in order just to proceed to even look at the extension. And they clearly know that their extension is up because they called to get the extension. So. But if I could I, I, add. I, yeah, sorry, go ahead. I just want to be clear though, that you spell out and if Aaron needs to send them another letter to confirm what it is the commission needs before we Put this on another agenda because I, I think it's a complete waste of staff time and your time if we're just going over these things again and again and again what do you, you know what do you need um, you know there are other parallels here I think we have another enforcement issue farther south um, uh, where the commission has clearly asked for um, you know flags to be reset survey um, a wetland scientist to be hired have we, have we required Mr. Wilson to hire a wetland scientist to uh, consult with him on this project moving forward? I mean, I'm just, I just don't wanna be back two weeks from now and have him come in and say, you know, what do you, what do you need from me? Or, or you know, or, or we, we, we re-discuss the same thing that's been discussed. Yeah. I agree I with second what Dave has said. I think yeah. we've got to go on strong and, ex and demand some expectation of why we should continue with this. Can you outline? Yeah. I mean, do do have we? Can you remind us, or or are there things that haven't been communicated with him yet, or or can we re-communicate uh, what we need, what the commission needs from him moving forward? Yeah, I agree that it's worth, I think we're overdoing it, but I do think that it's worth having a final, I'll just call it a final communication with him. Um, just reiterating that this is the deadline, this is what we need, so it needs to be surveyed. Um, before we can, you know, so that's the first step. Uh, after that, we are going to be requiring some sort of proposal on his point for, you um, for remediation of that site. And that is up to the applicant to propose that. And so that's the point, Dave, where I think you're trying to um, go is that that is gonna require a wetland scientist to develop some sort of plan. Um, and then that will be coming, that'll need to come before us, but we will need to be okay with that delineation. And then obviously we're gonna to have to have discussions about what that plan is. So I would argue that those- I, I don't wanna see us, I, I was gonna say, I don't wanna see us ask for more things like a delineation 
that allows him to postpone beyond the next deadline. Yeah, but I think, but didn't we already ask what Aaron asked him is that put the original flags back so we can therefore see what has been yeah. done. So we, we don't even know the extent. So I think it's, I think sticking with the simple thing, like there were flags out there already delineated, put them back. And a verification, they're correct. Correct, yeah. And I mean, that's not going to be enough for a continuation. I mean, maybe he gets a, you know, a, you know, a so many month continuation or something. If we do feel comfortable that there is, you know, some sort of progress, but, you know, it's going to be incremental at that point. Aaron, do you feel like you have enough direction to, to put something in writing to him? Yeah, I just want to really quickly, uh, sorry, I was trying to pull up. the letter really quickly that I already sent him to see if you guys feel like there's more that needs to be said. I mean, that definitely outlines the first steps that need to happen. I mean, this, this was uh, um, the next meeting of the Conservation Commission will be on December 9th, which I reached out to him prior to that meeting. If you could please provide an update via email on the status of the reflagging prior to that date, I will update the Conservation Commission once flagging has been relocated per the original so survey the CONCOM would like to schedule a site visit. So I reached out to him and he said it can't be surveyed until April. And I said that's not going to work, but um, I mean, I think that from where I stand, sending him something and saying, I, I would either favor Brett's position, no action, just let it run out and let him deal with the consequences or say to him, we need something from you by, uh, you know, the January 27th meeting. If we do not, if the site has not been surveyed by that date, or if we have not received something in writing from you. Um, outlining when the survey is going to take place prior to the February deadline, then um, no extension will be granted or something to that effect is another option. Um, well, one of the concerns I have with what that letter said was that you talk about the idea of what Bucky did, but I would like to see us expect that Bucky approves of what those redelineation, that really redelineation of that property flagging is. I don't trust him to do it himself. I don't trust the, the builder to do it himself. So this this is my recommendation for tonight. I don't think we need to, to take any action okay. or make a decision yeah. tonight. Why don't you guys think about it? And at the next meeting, we'll put this on the agenda once we've had a chance to think it over and then from there decide, do we wanna set a deadline for him? Cause we still will have about 30 days. Um, I just- um, Yeah, hold on though. Are, are, you, are you proposing Aaron that you that you don't send a letter between now and the next meeting because I don't I don't actually think that's I agree the best path I actually think you should send a letter um, okay like th that's my perspective others might disagree but that that's my that's my point of view just given given what I've heard tonight um, okay. I think doing nothing is not really an option I agree okay so what do you guys want me to say to him then if I was to send him a letter? I'm just I'm just concerned because we've got three other enforcement items to discuss and we have three emergency yeah. certs to discuss tonight yeah. and it's almost 10 o'clock. <laughs> yeah, the only other thing is, Laura, so when we say doing nothing, I think that's actually probably the worst consequence for him, mm -hmm. just to clarify. So like by doing yes. nothing, we're letting the time run out on his on his ability to do anything on the site. So what Aaron sending a letter would simply be a courtesy to remind him that the time, the clock is ticking and these are, and to clarify the things we need him to do, but mm -hmm. he should know that already. Mm -hmm. so, so in terms of like the harshest possible response that we can do right now, doing nothing is kind of it, mm -hmm. just, to just to clarify that. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I see your point. <laughs> and that, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the only other additional information potentially conveyed to him is, 
we don't, there are other surveyors out there. So, you know, this has been brought in front of the commission. The idea that you're going to need an extension because you can't find a surveyor is probably not going to carry water. Um, well, I, and I did express that to him via email. He I knows told, that. Okay. Knows I, more, I, think, more surveyors. Yeah, I think I'm with Dave's guidance here. You know, this has been a lot of time spent um, in a situation that is, there's no return on that time invest, invested. So, I mean, I would be tempted not to ask Aaron to spend any more time on it. I agree. And the only thing that I'm a little worried about is he's going to come in with something like, you know, end of February and, but we'll have to deal with it when that happens. And That's yeah, when we deal with it. It's probably not. Does it mean we have to act on it? So, yep. Yeah, I'm well, fine I with that. I mean, I, I think it's, I think it's been a good discussion, as I said before, and um, Jen, your point is well taken, and Brett, yours is too, that, you know, nothing, nothing, sending nothing or, or, you know, letting the clock run out. I mean, keep in mind that that just restarts everything. It's not like I want the abutters to realize that's not saying he can't develop houses or a house on the, the, the property. It just means he has to start over in the NOI process, you know, with you, which is fine, but we will be beginning from a point of put up those flags so we can see where the original wetlands were flagged back in 2018, 19, right? So that's, that's fine. We can start, start it all over again. And the enforcement is a separate issue. And so the enforcement still stands. And so even if he does not choose to continue, let's say, um, we still will require some remediation there. So that's a separate issue. Okay, so if so I'm hearing, I'll, I'll maybe put this on for the next agenda. And if there's any updates between now and then, I can provide them to you at that time. And if anybody feels strongly that we should reach out to him between now and then we can we can bring it up at the next meeting. Yeah, I am personally I'm perfectly fine with no action. I, I am I am too. So okay. That's it that's it's okay with you, Laura. Okay. Okay. So I think we reached our non-decision on this topic. So <laughs> things are just how they were before. But yeah, this is an important one. And particularly thank you to the abutters. Um, that's very helpful and yeah and uh, I just also want to reiterate what um, Aaron was saying so yeah if you are interested in getting updates when we have those um, getting in touch with Aaron would be great okay guys I have to head out for tonight I have a wicked early start tomorrow but thank okay. you nice to see you all good night Jen good night bye Jen okay so Aaron should we move on to the next enforcement yeah, so this one will be much quicker, I hope. Um, so this is related to the poor farm um, project and basically um, sort of towards the end of the year last year, um, I had been in contact with Natural Heritage. We had discussed the fact that there hadn't been any action taken towards the restoration plan for Natural Heritage or for the CONCOM. And so um, Rebecca um, Zimmer and myself set sort of a um, timeline for um, Sabina's property and said um, this these are the benchmarks that we'd like you to reach and the dates we'd like you to reach them. They responded back and said this is too aggressive of a timeline we want to slow it down a little bit and so they came up with a proposed alternate timeline to which Rebecca and I said that's fine that's that's fine but now we've gotten a second request to put it off again and um, Rebecca and I spoke and Rebecca is really not in favor of putting it off any further. Um, and, uh, I also, I've spoken with at least one consultant that she's been in touch with that she did not, um, contract with to do the restoration. Um, I've also, she's been sent the list of biologists twice and hasn't proceeded with that. I have been in contact with her wetland scientist. So there's two issues here. There's the biologist who designed the natural heritage plan. And then there's the wetland scientist to do our wetland restoration. The wetland person is in the process of 
um, trying to meet the existing deadline, which is at, I believe at the end of January. So, or January 21st, I think, to get the plan to us. So this is basically just an inquiry as to whether or not you guys are in favor of pushing out the timeline any further, or if you feel strongly, we should stick to it because I, when the request came in, I said, I'll put it by the commission and see if they're willing to go push this timeline out even further. And um, yeah. Yeah, can you remind us again, Aaron, of when the initial deadline was, when it got pushed to and what's being proposed? Ooh, um, just general is okay by my. Yeah, so so right now it was the the initial plan um, for us to review was supposed to be submitted by January twenty first. Um, prior to that, it was earlier in January. They had, they just kind of pushed everything out by like two or three weeks okay. later than what we had yep. originally requested. Um, but we set the deadlines because nothing was happening. Um, and what are they asking for a extension at this point? She asked for two or three week extension on the initial, just the initial plan submission for staff review. Mm -hmm. So it's like basically six weeks from the original date that we had proposed. Yeah, I mean, so do you see any ramifications for giving for giving an extension i don't see personally i don't see any problem with it i mean yeah it is kind of weird and you wonder what they're doing but so i mean my only i guess and i've spoken with dep about it as well um enforcement orders are good for two years it's been six months so um and we haven't even seen any type of restoration of any sort you know just that dragging it on is going to, you know, limit our ability to enforce. And um, I think we've been very lenient um, as far as making them do, get the restoration plan together and approved. So, I mean. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I don't disagree with that. I don't know. Maybe I'm just, <laughs> it's late in the evening and I'm kind of tired. Um, but yeah, I'm okay with an extension. I mean, it's not a great precedent and all of that, but um, yeah, I am I just think that if we come down yeah, too hard on this, it's going to come back and bite us. I mean, should you say something about like, you know, we're willing to do this extension, I don't know, but say we need we really 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 need to see something <laughs> kind of or that this is it extension or this is the yeah, last extension Aaron, could you say how long again they asked for um so the february 21st deadline was the plan to get us the restoration for wetlands and for from the biologist as well and i believe she asked for two or three weeks for an extension from that, which was, they had already asked for two or three weeks previously from the original proposal. Yeah, I mean, I don't expect that they're gonna be doing much this time of year anyway. So I don't think that there's ramifications for sort of on the ground work. Um, unless, unless there's okay. something that's in there. But. Okay. Well, it sounds like you guys aren't opposed to the extension. So that's okay. I just wanted yeah. to make sure I felt that out with you guys before I it doesn't, it doesn't really, you know, I don't, I, I just want to make sure it gets done. Yeah. I would say that's unfortunate, Aaron. Um, so yeah, I'm not happy about it, but yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to try to burn through these other ones as quickly as I can. The, um, we got a complaint about uh, forest cutting on Trillium Way. Um, it was over the week between Christmas and New Year's. Um, it was the property that had been purchased by Amir Mikchi, who we've also, um, he also owns the South Amherst Crossing. Mm -hmm. Or, yeah, um, so it's Northeast, um, Southeast Street Crossing. Um, anyways, uh, come again? The one we talked about earlier today. So where they're doing the Yeah, exactly. Hammett Brook or uh, 
Daring Brook um, stuff. So long story short, I've been in touch with them and the work that they did was outside of 100 feet. They did get approval from Natural Heritage because it was a Natural Heritage area. So I'm monitoring what they're doing, making sure that, that you know, everything is okay from a wetland standpoint, but just wanted to make sure that you guys knew I'd followed up on it and kind of closed the loop on it. Um, they did have a wetland scientist go out and flag it and they had a plan which they provided to me showing they were over 100 feet, over 100 feet away. So we're good. Um, <clears throat> there was another- I'm sorry. Um, I'm sorry, Aaron, just related to that one. You were um, in your position when Amir came before us for that Southeast street one. So you're familiar with working with him. There's a little bit of. Uh, I, I issued the I enforcement that. order. Yeah, she, yeah, she, you were at the right. You shut it down. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. Right. Yeah. I, so I wasn't for the original permit, but for the um, stabilization. Yes. Yep. Good. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Um, also, uh, we were notified about cutting at 562 South Pleasant Street. Um, I went out, um, uh, knocked on the people's door, tried to make contact with them. They didn't answer the door, even though their cars were there. I wrote them a letter saying, we've got a complaint about cutting on your property. I would like to set up an appointment with you right away to come view it. Um, they received that via certified mail. I went back again, knocked on the door, nobody answered, but I have taken pictures to document the cutting. Um, and it's kind of, one of those situations where I think landowners who are working from home, doing some homesteading in their backyard with chickens and stuff, um, maybe unfamiliar with wetland laws are out there doing some clearing. And I hesitated issuing an enforcement order. I did tell them to cease and desist in the letter I sent. Um, but I were trying to find other ways to reach them and get in contact with them to kind of discuss this with them. But um, <laughs> I just have so many enforcement orders. I'm really like, I don't want to issue any more, but if, if we feel like we need to issue one, I'm happy to issue uh, you know, an enforcement order to them. I just want to make sure that I'm also working with people who maybe have no idea that they're doing anything wrong before. Is it really like really heavy clearing? Are there like log trucks leaving or? It's not oh. log trucks. It looks like somebody back there with a chainsaw who's really going kind of got a new chainsaw. Like maybe maybe trying to get some some uh, uh, firewood cut or something, but they're just yeah. they've gone overboard <laughs> and cleared a pretty significant chunk of wetland um, in their backyard. Nice. I mean, that's just unfortunate that they're not that you're that they're not responding to anything. So, and that's kind of strange. Yeah. Well. You know, for me, it was a little scary knocking on the door with COVID because it's like sight unseen. I don't know why they're not answering the door, you know? So it's like, if they're sick inside, I'm like, uh, <laughs> you know, I don't know. Um, but I've, I've definitely tried to reach out to them a couple times, but I'll continue to do so. And if you guys feel strongly, I should issue an enforcement order. I will, I will do that. I just felt like I should talk to them first. Um, do you know if it's still, so that's kind of, are they still clearing or are they kind of done? They were, I just got the return receipt that they received my letter um, today in, in the mail. So um, they may have just received the letter in the last few days. Okay. Yeah. Um, if you just kind of keep us abreast, uh, I'm okay without an enforcement order at this point. It'd be great to talk to them first and figure it out. So. Okay. All right. I, I will speak to them and maybe ask them if I can reach them, ask them to come to the next meeting. That'd be great. Okay. Um, so the last three items um, on the agenda are all um, emergency certifications. And I, I'm going to just bomb through them really quickly. And I think we can handle them very quickly with, um, with motions. Uh, the first is the Hickory Ridge remediation <laughs> work. Um, is underway and um, they are hoping to have that work completed by the end of um, January. And you should have had the actual um, uh, 
uh, emergency cert in your packets. Uh, but let me see if I can grab it because I was very right there. Um, I was very specific about the conditions on this one that they were supposed to be following. Um, I don't want to hold up time here. Let me see. Skippage. Why am I not able to put my finger on it? Sorry, I thought this was. Um... All right, I'm not able to put my fingers on it. Sorry about that. Um, basically, I'll just I'll just kind of paraphrase what my conditions were for you guys. Um, they had provided a really in-depth letter, which I did put in your packets, which basically outlined all the conditions that they were following and all the work that they were doing. Um, the conditions were that they install erosion controls prior to the start of work, that they um, that the site entire site has to be stabilized before the erosion controls are removed. Um, they had there had been some question in the in the um, documentation about whether or not they were going to be dewatering on site or removing the contaminated water from the site. I basically told them in the emergency cert that they had to remove the contaminated water from the site. And if any, if they um, determine otherwise, then um, they needed to get permission from me first or permission from the board first to um, proceed with that. Um, so I mean I uh, you know just standard standard conditions no no um, uh, equipment in the wetlands. Um, it was a relatively small area that they're excavating to do the cleanup, and yeah, so I issued the emergency certification um, on January sixth for that, and so basically I'd just be looking for you guys to ratify that. Yeah, and I did try to read through some of that report and whew, it was a beast. Yeah, it is. <clears throat> I am fine with this. So looking for a motion or? Oh, so I move to uh, issue the emergency certification for Hager Ridge uh, mediation, remediation. With the conditions that Aaron stated? Or the conditions that Aaron stated. Second. Oh, Larry got me. Okay, Leroy. Hi. Larry. Hi. Fletcher. Aye. Anna. Aye. Laura. Aye. And I from me as well. Okay, next please, Erin. Yep. Um, so uh, on Pomeroy Court, um, there is a huge beaver dam that has a ton of water behind it. Again. And um, we basically determined that there it was becoming a safety issue and that we needed to do a little drawdown back there um, to get the water level a little lower. So um, it just sort of incremental release of water from behind that beaver dam so that it doesn't wash out that road is very uh, dangerous right now. Um, and I have also been in touch with Eversource about it. They are actually actively trapping this week. Um, so combination of trapping and, and uh, breaching, I think is gonna really help that situation out. But the, the, info, the emergency cert that I issued was just to do very incremental breaching of the dam to allow some water to um, uh, draw down from the impoundment that they've created. And that's hand work um, with monitoring. So just looking to ratify that one as well. They need to close that road and anyone that lives there has to buy like a duck boat or something <laughs> and just let the beavers take it. I mean, this is every year, Yeah, multiple it, times a year. Yeah. I mean, how many beaver pelts can you really take? <laughs> All right. But I, I will I will move to certify the uh, emergency certification for the flooding okay. of Pomeroy Court. I second that. Oh, Laura. It's okay, guys. Someday I'll get there. Anna. Aye. Laura. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Larry. Aye. Leroy. Aye. Okay. And I, for me as well, and yeah, hopefully they can come up with a long-term solution because I'm with you, Fletcher. It's been yeah, it's like the fur trade was like a long time ago. I mean, I, don't know. I heard it's good eating, but 
I don't know. No. Really? Oh, gross. Somebody told me. I was kind of surprised. Too gamey. Uh, yeah. It's <laughs> like, Not appealing. <laughs> Which just means more for you. So. I'm a vegan, so it's not going to be me. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. You won't make an exception for the Pomeroy Coit beavers. Especially not that exception, Anna. So, um, so <laughs> yeah, can you take us to the last one, Aaron? Yes. Uh, this is a 682 Station Road, two hazard trees um, immediately adjacent to a home. Um, the trees are not located in the wetland. They're located in the buffer zone. This is a bylaw jurisdiction only. And uh, they had a report from a arborist stating that the trees were imminent hazard to public health and safety. So we issued, they were very small diameter trees. They were like maybe eight inch diameter trees. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I issued an approval for two of those trees to be removed and just looking to have that ratified. Sounds good. I no move that we ratify the emergency certification for station road i'm just gonna say station road with the conditions as as stated second i much prefer so moved <laughs> i don't though i i really gotta say it out yeah come on larry just because jen's just because jen's not here yeah okay. Anna, how do you vote aye uh fletcher aye larry aye roy aye laura aye and I for me as well. Are we there, Aaron, or something else? We're there. All we need yes. is to adjourn. <laughs> We're looking for the final motion. I move uh, we adjourn this meeting. We'll say the whole thing, y'all. Second. <laughs> Anna? Aye. Fletcher? Aye. Larry? Aye. Roy? Aye. Laura? Aye. Aye for me as well. So I am going to stop the recording.